Hello everyone, and welcome to another stream. How y'all doing? Hope you're having a good one. Welcome, welcome. Ooh, Robert Prockgum, thanks for three months, says six months until biggest, stinkiest baby and his two forgotten siblings will have the first ever YouTube sub baby. That's true. We haven't had a YouTube sub baby because I haven't had YouTube memberships for nine months yet. You may be the first. If you have the first one, I will give that baby special powers. <laughs> so welcome everyone i hope you had a great holiday i hope you had a good halloween um of course i took yesterday off had a nice day off um it was it was it was good i went out and since i've been doing better with my hair i do need uh, today's like a day i probably need to wash it because it's been a few days not good to wash your hair every day necessarily it'll dry it out especially if you already have dry hair anyway but like yesterday i went out with really good hair and it was weird. It's very strange. I talked to Baja about this, but the way you get treated when you're perceived a certain way by men is very different. It's interesting. Hmm. <laughs> How about this one? That'll do. <sighs> so anyway, today we're looking at John Doyle having bad media takes. He has a whole new video that's titled... Top five implicitly right-wing Halloween movies. Now, before any of John Doyle's, like, stands in the comments are like, Uh, he's just joking. People don't ever understand his jokes. Hiding behind 17 layers of irony doesn't make your takes any less stupid. Either way, he's using these films as a jumping-off point to talk about his right-wing worldview. So I'm still gonna make fun of this fucking dork. Sound good? Great. Okay, so we know what we're doing. We could probably just get into it. This video is an hour long, so I don't know how long it'll take us to get through this. You guys know that I am a big horror film aficionado. If you can take a look at, like, literally all of the background here. I like a horror film or two. I know a thing or two about films that uh, go bump in the night. Okay? So it's gonna be fun uh, just making fun of John, basically. Avant Gardner with a $20 tip. Thank you. It says, got a good paycheck today. Wanted to have that direct support. Thanks as always for an entertaining time. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks to everyone who helps keep the show running. It means a lot. All right. So let's uh, jump into it. Let's just do it. Like Nike, but there's a Nazi. Nazi K. Mm -hmm. I know what you're thinking. All these things going on in the world right now, World War Three, mass acts of violence, certainly all- Oh yeah, I missed World War Three breaking out. Cool beans, cool beans. Hey, um, John, could you do me a favor and just keep talking about like horror movies today? I really don't want you to dig into like the Palestine situation because I think that would mentally just be too much. Just say dumb shit about horror movies so I can make fun of you and tell you how much John Carpenter would hate you to your face. Gnome Pickles with $5 says, Translation of every time a right-winger says that it's a joke. Quote, I got caught saying the worst thing ever, and I need an excuse. Oh, John is quiet. I turned it down for the music and forgot to turn it back up. Thank you for pointing that out, Baja. All these things can't just be happening right now, coincidentally. And you're right, but honestly, it's really just more of the same. You know, people pick up on it at different times, but really it's been going on for a while now. Maybe it's accelerated recently, but I mean, think about it. Why do you think they've corrupted and destroyed the influence of the church so that our women... It's <laughs> the implication, by the way, and who's this they? We know who he thinks the they is. The implication that fewer people being religious isn't a natural phenomena but must be something that is being caused maliciously is so funny because it belies such a lack of understanding of the perspective of others that only a right winger could have. <laughs> Why are people leaving our church that's incredibly out of date, bigoted, hateful, and tells people things that are objectively, testably untrue? It must be them. No, no, there's just more access to information and people see different perspectives. That's fine. That's fine. The makeup of the religious denominations of any given area over time are not static, generally. Like, things change over a period of time. We are in a period of change. That's fine. 
attend these Halloween parties dressed like prostitutes so that young men of upstanding character will have no interest in attending. John, do you consider yourself a young man of upstanding character? Them. Or otherwise, nobody goes at all because they're just going to get shot up because they've strategically installed these district attorneys who will simply release criminals from prison or just for... John, mass shooters don't get released and mass shooters are more likely to be fans of yours than they are some other thing that you're alluding to. Literally, what are you talking about? Mass shootings aren't done by, like, criminals who maybe, I don't know, looted a store or something. That's whatever. We're talking about property damage there. You're talking about mass shooters. What are you doing? This is bad even by your standards. We're only 30 seconds in. Now, you're thinking of Nick Fuentes, who has the cat boy, not boyfriend. John Doyle's just a dork. Refused to pro and not in a fun way. I mean dork derogatorily. Not in like, oh, there are people who are dorks that are cool. I mean like... Let me describe what I mean by that, and maybe we should come up with another word, because dork has been reformed to mean good things. John Doyle is so insecure that he feels the need to compensate by fronting a persona that is the opposite of that in every way, and everything is couched in a mile-deep layer of irony. That's indicative of an incredibly insecure person with, I don't think, a very secure identity who's trying to lob onto this right-wing bullshit in order to defend himself from whatever feelings inside he doesn't like. And I don't know what those are, and that's not my problem or my business. But boy, has it turned this person into just a layer cake of a nightmare of a human being. Prosecute them in the first place. It's like a parfait, but... You taste it and you're like, why does this taste like the Third Reich? Why do you think they've propagandized our society into embracing political correctness and cancel? Uh, propaganda is when you can't say racial slurs anymore without people looking at you funny. Culture. So you can't dress up as anything funny anymore. I need you to remember. What do you consider funny, John? Like, do you just think racist characters are the funniest thing because you're five? These people are trying to start World War III to distract you from carving pumpkins because then all the evil spirits would be scared away and the bad guys would lose. Few understand this, but we understand that. John, I know you're joking here and being facetious. I get it. But like, you're not the good guy as much as there is such a thing as a good or bad guy, which I think is kind of a flawed thing anyway. You're not that. You're not that. Kyle Rittenhouse is literally one of your biggest fans and when you met him, you like... He fanboyed over you, and you did in return. What are you doing, John? This, the war on Halloween is real, folks, and it's right here. It's right in front of us, but it's okay. I will not let you down. The spirit of Robert E. Lee appeared to me in a vision after he was released from the statue before ascending into heaven. He told me the absolute best thing I can do right now to fight the bad guys is to autistically overanalyze Halloween movies in accordance with my worldview. And if I... I don't think he could have slurred through that with how drunk he typically was. Do this, I'm granted amnesty for my Yankee heritage. Don't have to tell me twice. Yes, sir, General Lee. Again, let me remind you, John Doyle is from the same state as me. He's from Michigan. Michigan wasn't even close to being in the Confederacy, which I know he referenced there. The worst kind of Michigan person is the weirdo Michigan person who has a Confederate flag. Like, you know what it means. In the South, like, it doesn't work either. Everyone knows what the dog whistle is about when they're like, it's not hate, it's heritage. Heritage of what? But in Michigan, it's even worse. Because you really don't have an excuse, do you? You just wanted to put up a Nazi flag, but you thought that might actually get you punched in the face. So you went with the soft Nazi flag. <laughs> I'll take it from here. But it is true, the entire genre of Halloween movies, horror movies, it does tend to be one of the more explicitly right-wing genres of media. Does it? That's such a bad read. I don't even know where to begin. What are you talking about, John? Horror is explicitly one of the most progressive forms of media. It tends to be lower budget. It tends to be created by people who are wanting to create projects that are considered subversive by general audience standards usually the idea that in any way horror as a whole has a right-leaning like bent that's not even a joke you can't even pretend that's like some sort of ironic joke it's just an incorrect statement 
that comes from a place of no understanding of the history of horror at all. Like, the origin of horror in the United States is a long one, but even the origin of, like, American horror um, as we know it today, and I'm talking about talkies more so. There's, of course, the precursors in silent horror. But when we're talking about, like, really big horror films from, like, the 30s during, like, the universal monster cycle that kicked off uh, America's obsession with horror films and stuff. Look at um, James Whale, who directed Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, openly gay man in the 30s. And if you've seen Frankenstein or Bride of Frankenstein, these are stories very much about monsters, air quote, who are outsiders, misunderstood, created without an understanding of who they are or why society views them as monstrous, being feared and being, you know, pitchforked and torched, right? The idea that, like, there isn't an embedded outsider progressive viewpoint inherent in the history of American horror is just wild to me. You know nothing. And it is important to have a trained eye with popular culture because, as I'm sure you know, something like 80% of everything that comes out of the average person's mouth is in reference to pop culture. You didn't know I was such a horror buff. Did you think this was just set? <laughs> no, I, I, I love it. I love horror. Here's my Universal Monsters collection with the 30 Universal Monsters from, um, from Phantom of the Opera to Creature from the Black Lagoon have the different universal monsters things that aren't well universal horror these aren't the monster ones these are more like the gothic horrors this has like black castle shadow of the cat cat people stuff like that um and then i have my arrow stuff i have my slasher stuff up here this is my slasher hall of uh fame so that's not most of my slasher films those are just the ones that i think are slasher icons you know your Norman Bates, your Leatherface, your Michael Myers, uh, Jason, Freddy, Chucky, Ghostface, Jigsaw, I Know What You Did Last Summer Guy, whose name, I don't know if he has a name, and uh, Megan is the most recent edition. I'm calling my shot on that one with Megan. I'm calling my shot with Megan. I think Megan's going to have some successful sequels, but I really liked the first one either way. Anyway, Alfred Hitchcock's movies, The Fly movies, a whole bunch of shit. There's my resume. <laughs> most of my other stuff's downstairs. Or the latest thing, etc. Also, the most effective medium of dissemination. Any recommendations? I have many recommendations. Um, early 2000s slasher that we watched the other night that I'd never seen before with David Boreanaz called Valentine. It's a Valentine's Day themed early 2000s slasher. Uh, definitely was riding the wave of Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer style. So if you like those movies, it's pretty fun. It's not perfect. The ending's kind of eh. But overall, it's pretty fun. Um, Uncle Sam's a funny 90s slasher. With one of the best lenticular covers of all time, by the way. I wonder if John's seen this one. It's a movie that very explicitly criticizes American uh, jingoism. But right, horrors, right wing, right, John? I do have Black Christmas. Black Christmas is great. <sighs> anyway. Oh, and I brought my American psycho up here too in case he did the thing. In case he did the thing. I did bring this just in case. <laughs> Eliminating information that's actually going to be retained by people is and always has been storytelling. And so there is actually some utility in these sorts of discussions. And some of them, yeah, are less serious, but some of them do actually contain some pretty important points about the changing cultural and political landscape of our society, especially throughout the last several decades. So there are some important themes and motifs that we should cover. But honestly, that's all more or less a rationalization. We're doing it because it's fun and I want to. So I will provide to you the correct analyses of these films for your Halloween mirth, merriments, and otherwise general enjoyments, and we will all be better off for it, oh. except George Soros. He will literally tickle, tickle himself in a panic if you watch this video all the way through, because we will go over whether the horror genre is left-wing or right-wing. So I'm guessing he couldn't get that through to YouTube, so he dubbed over it. Other films, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, pretty good. Um, let 
Maximum Overdrive, the only movie that... Wait, no, Steven Spielberg... Or not Steven Spielberg, sorry. Um, Stephen King directed this, and I believe he directed the terrible made-for-TV The Shining. Anyway, this one's about killer cars, and I'm pretty sure he was on cocaine the whole time he directed it, so that's fun. Drag Me to Hell, underrated Sam Raimi movie. Not my favorite Sam Raimi movie, but it's a good one. All right, I'll stop just showing off my collection now. I've done that. Robert Prokagam says, no, 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 you don't get it. Horror is right wing because it's all about strong men getting to have their way with low value women and weak men. Ugh, I know you're being facetious, but holy shit, that's probably what he's gonna say. <laughs> um, Two genders in a trench coat says, I'm scared. What do you think of Silence of the Lambs? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, I know, Prokagam. I know. Um, he has a decent number of subscribers, but they haven't gone up much in the last two or three years because he doesn't post that often. Um, and this video has 10,000 views so far, and it's been up for like 10 hours, which isn't very good for him. But I don't think his audience is growing. He has an audience of shit posting Zoomer Nazis who are like insecure I words. Oh, we're on YouTube. I can say this. Insecure incels who instead of improving themselves, have decided to glob onto a right-wing fascist ideology instead of self-analyzing for what their problems are. Some brief themes of each, why it's significant, how those themes have changed throughout America's cultural landscape throughout the decades, how it's used to both subvert and affirm our traditional standards, why so many leftists love it and want to claim it, whether it's even possible. Want to claim it? You're the one trying to claim it. What are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? Horror is historically so progressive and gay and just, I don't even know. Like, does he believe this or is he just trying to posture to lie to his audience? I can't even tell. I can't tell genuinely. Is he misunderstanding and he's that stupid or is he just think his audience is so stupid that they'll believe him? And he'd be right. Of course they'll believe him. They wouldn't be subscribed if they weren't stupid. <laughs> I just don't get it. To make good left-wing horror. And then, of course, our tremendous list, which will continue and expand upon these discussions. So do stay tuned. A lot of horror movies do have a political message, Bullet Bill. Like, horror is a pretty political genre a lot of the time. Not always, but you don't have to make fun of that. There are often political undertones. Uh, the problem is he can't analyze things past surface level, like people who think Fight Club wasn't critiquing toxic masculinity. Yeah. John Doyle in. Heck off, Tommy. Yeah, I have no idea why he still uses that intro. It's so out of date, even by right-wing standards. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Has he seen um, Candyman? And welcome to Heck Off Kami. You know, I can't just start the list, right? I have things to say first. But do you like my Halloween costume? I'm going as guy who has the correct take on literally every movie ever and who likes pumpkins. Okay, here's the thing. I get it, we're all excited here. I have to lay down some ground rules first. First of all, I get messages now all the time from people who are just memeing it too hard. Oh, John, is this inherently right wing? What about this? Is this implicitly right wing inherently? Stop it. You're being... Okay, I know he's being facetious too. To be clear before we start this, I know he's going to do a thing here and I want to preempt it. I believe in death of the author. You couldn't read anything into any piece of media ever. And it can be a valid interpretation as long as it is evidenced by the text and you can properly, you know, support your argument. Even if I disagree with it, I can still see someone else's reading if it is properly evidenced by the thing. And it's all subjective anyway. So there often isn't an objectively right meaning of a film as much as it is what you, the audience, get out of it. However, the problem with John is, it's not just that he's reading things differently, it's that he is reading things that are not there and are not evidenced by the film in any way whatsoever. He tries to graft shitty right-wing talking points onto movies, which is kind of the reverse of what you're supposed to do. I have lost weight, thank you for asking. I've lost actually a lot of weight. I'm, I'm doing really well. Hmm too entropic. You're flying too close to the sun, like a liberal. I did not come out and declare that Beauty and the Beast was implicitly right-wing because it was funny. I did it because it was sexist 
and vaguely anti-LGBT depending upon your position on the Beast Furry question. The point mm -hmm. And then I got your merch store taken down over it. Remember that? That was fun. The point is, things actually have to be right. I wonder if his merch store is still down. Did he ever get that back up? Oh, he actually looks like he... No, that's a, that's a sponsor. Let's see. Do you ever get that merch back up? Oh, the whole website's under maintenance. Womp womp. <laughs> he got he got a, he got a nice little graphic of the the ugly car from the beginning of his intro though, so that's good. He's got that going for him, which is nice. Oh. Right wing. Otherwise, you're just being stupid and subjective. That's left wing. Now that being. Art analysis is always subjective. Like, you can talk about objective facts about the movie. Like, in this scene, there are this many cuts. Or in this scene, there are this many, you know, of this kind of shot. Or it used this kind of lens. That's objective. An analysis of the actual meaning of a film is always subjective to some extent or another. Unless you're literally talking about intent. Which is a whole separate issue. Said, do I need anything from Meyer? Let me think for a sec. I needed something. What was it? Shoot. We were out of something that was like a house thing. Do we have, we have trash bags, I think, right? Did we need more toilet paper? I have chicken, I have bread, I have cheese. I'm trying to think, I'll think about it. There are some honorable mentions, sure. This is not a definitive list. Oh, napkins, we were out of napkins. That's what it was. This is just five things that immediately came to mind. I'm also not commanding you to go watch these movies necessarily. Some of them are pretty rough, and I, of course, disavow all violence, etc., etc. Look, I'm just a film critic. I'm just a guy who likes ideas. And speaking of ideas, I will be debating key Gamergate figure Brianna Wu on November 6th at the University of South Carolina. Who's Brianna Wu? Lina on the issue of pornography. Some of you may be too young to understand the significance of this, but you should... Oh, boy. So is she like a feminist and he's going to do his right wing bullshit? Still all definitely come watch. I'll put a link in the description where you can get tickets and more information. Nice. Anyways, speaking of honorable mentions, that reminds me of another thing. The things we discuss have to be central to the plot. Like Friday the 13th, for example, after I tweeted my review of the Super Mario Bros. movie in Scream 6, I had a guy... Let's see what it says. The Super Mario Bros. movie was epic and cool, unlike the last movie I saw in the theater, Scream 6, which was anti-white and gay. Um, why did you pay for a gay movie? This reeks of low discernment. John says, wanted to see if they could still pull off a mainstream franchise slasher in 2023. Did you see Scream 5? Scream 6 wasn't even the first one in the new trilogy. Uh, Fright says, John, do you endorse uh, Friday the 13th Jason Voorhees as a vigilante Christian justice? Is he one of our guys? Oh, God. He did put out the porn manifesto. We covered it. It was stupid. Um, okay, so actually, let's talk about this real quick. Uh, Scream 5 and 6, and they're doing another one. It's like a new trilogy. There's sort of two trilogies and a middle film that connects the two. So there's Scream 1, 2, and 3, which make their own trilogy. There's Scream 4, which is kind of on its own island. It's a weird transitory period. I don't dislike that movie. Uh, it's shot a little weird, but, like, it's a good movie. And then there's the new trilogy, which is following kind of a new main character, though it still has ties to the original, and Sydney shows up. But it's more following a new main character, and they've done two so far. And they've been good. Um, you know, it's a modern movie, so yes, the cast is diverse. That's not an agenda, it's just how the world works. John, I know that you, like, lived in a wealthy suburb of Detroit. So, like, I don't know what the makeup of people around you was in school. But in the real world, yeah, people around you look different than you, maybe think different than you, some are straight, some are gay, some are bi, whatever, doesn't matter. Homogeneity is not somehow more accurate. They seem to think it is. They think that like straight white homogeneity is somehow the default and everything that is not that is some sort of perversion. I ask if I endorse Jason Voorhees as an example of vigilante Christian justice. So I thought about it. Jason went to hell. Jason is not a Christian. Jason went to hell. They made a whole movie about it. Is he one of our guys? Okay, well, doesn't talk. That's probably autism. Punishes sinners. He's got mommy issues. Can we not use that word this way? Please? It's arch nemesis. Praise upon children. Like, okay, yeah, I'm thinking this is our guy. Or even something like the original. 
I'm sorry, are you implying that Freddy Krueger is Jason Voorhees' arch nemesis? That's a dumb take. They met literally once. Twice if you count the cameo of the glove at the end of Jason Goes to Hell, which you really shouldn't count. Asinine. <laughs> also, Jason preys on children. What are you talking about? They both do. Original Black Christmas from 1974, which John Carpenter took a lot of inspiration from for Halloween, particularly in the cinematography. That Dean Cundy was the director of cinematography for Halloween. That movie of not John Carpenter. It's for the record. Director and director of photography are two different things. Of course, sparking the popularity of slasher films. You could argue that's all thanks to Black Christmas. Maybe Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. But anyways, the guy. Texas. Oh no, duh. Two, two, two. T O O. I was thinking about the Dennis Hopper one, and I was like, what? Black Christmas. He's basically like an autistic incel. Which, if, if you haven't seen that movie, you should definitely check it out. It's genuinely unsettling. But like, what kind of message does that send? You know, like, yeah. Can the character be literally me? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily make it a right-wing Halloween movie. You know, we have to play by the rules. Also, I have to be responsible with my messaging, okay? It hurts the movement if I come out and say, top five right-wing Halloween movies. And then the reason for each one is that the guy's an autistic incel, okay? That makes us look bad. I can't be doing that. President Trump needs me to not do that. It's reckless. It's irresponsible. We are cool and well-adjusted guys, actually. But yeah, the themes in the story are important. It can't be something too obvious, something explicit, obviously. Like, it can't just be... Oh, you know, The Exorcist. Demons are real. Hereditary. I think that one's actually... I, I think The Exorcist is actually one that he could claim. I don't think that's untrue. I could argue that's conservative, but not right-wing, if that makes sense. It's conservative in the sense that The Exorcist, a lot of it is about that struggle between modern science not being able to deal with this, like, demonic threat and not understanding it because it's supernatural. And then eventually succumbing to, okay, let's try the old way. Let's try this old way of doing things, which is the exorcism. So I could call that conservative, backward thinking. Sure. Right wing, not though, because that implies a lot of things that aren't true about that movie. Women are crazy. Also, demons are real. Like, it has to be... Imp demons being real is in, in a horror movie is not inherently right wing or Christian. Like, demons in horror movies aren't even always biblical demons. They are a lot of the time in the United States, but not always. Implicit. And it can't be something like They Live, where the messaging is very obvious and people- They Live is not a right-wing film, and I knew he was gonna go here. John Carpenter would fucking hate you, John. What are you talking about? John Carpenter would have no time for you. Jesus Christ. They Live was a movie I made towards the end of the 80s, and I was reflecting on a lot of the values that I saw around me at the time, mainly inspired by Ronald Reagan's conservative revolution. There was a great deal of obsession with greed and making a lot of money, and some of the values that I grew up with had been pushed aside. So I decided to scream out in the middle of the night and make a statement about that. And They Live is partially a political statement. It's partially... It's an anti-Reaganomics film. It's an anti-capitalism film. It's like, how can you be this wrong? Uh, attract on the world that we live in today. And as a matter of fact, right now, it's even more true than it was then. Uh, we are manipulated by a lot of media around us. We are consumed by consumerism. And uh, as you can see, the recent events in this country, they are still among us. They do live, indeed. The 80s never ended. The Reagan Revolution never ended. Although there is now a pull towards the left. Mm -hmm. I, would, I admit that. The right is, in this country, the right is confused and lost. And, but they may win. They may win, and oh, what they want to do is beyond Reagan. You know, they've moved so far to the right. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really unrestrained capitalism that I'm criticizing. I'm, I'm a capitalist. I love capitalism. I love making money. But unrestrained capitalism is, uh, is, leads to depressions. It leads to the recession that we had. Uh -huh. So the 80s never ended. They're still here. They're still on Earth exploiting us. John, he doesn't like you. We'll say, okay, well, where do you draw the line then? 
I don't know. Guess we'll find out. Because some people will say the messaging in a movie like Invasion of the Body Snatchers is really obvious with the whole take of... Mo well, it's about McCart... That's about communism yeah it's about fears of communism McCarthyism and mccarthyism is so crazy and silly it's like bro that's what happened they were right and people no they weren't john will say that's a good example of left-wing horror which i think is absurd because I, I don't think it is i don't think it is about mccarthyism as much as it's about again it's about red scare generally i think you're misunderstanding what people say about invasion of the body snatchers that entire genre like science fiction movies that deal with things of that nature those are all very right wing because the essential conflicts in a lot of these movies they're really are... not i don't know what i'd label i'm trying to think in terms of the thing political motivations it's certainly about paranoia but having a direct political ideology that I can imagine tied to that specifically is a little, it's a little broad for that. The themes are a little broad for me to pin it to any particular political ideology because every political ideology could succumb to paranoia. In fact, paranoia in political spaces in America is a huge theme. Literally, one of the most famous essays on um, conspiracies ever written is... Um, the conspiratorial style of American politics. Um, something like that. Let me actually look at the name of the guy. I have it on my thing. Um, Audible. By the way, if you're looking to get into researching any sort of conspiratorial stuff, The Paranoid Style in American Politics by Richard Hofstadter is a pretty good place to start. Um, most literature on conspiracy theories uh, references him in some way. It's kind of the bedrock of talking about modern conspiratorial movements and how they're related to American politics. So I'd recommend it. About us versus them. Fears of... Sub it could be about Cold War paranoia. It's a little late for that. Like, we're talking mid to late 80s. Like, the wall was about to come down. So it might be related vaguely to that. But again, I just think it's more a general paranoia version by foreign populations, loss of identity, et cetera, et cetera. And so they'll take that and they'll be like, well, given the cultural context at the time, it's actually left wing. And it's like, okay, you know, this is a recurring theme with these people because I honestly don't know if it's possible to really make left wing horror. Like it's been done before. What? <laughs> oh my God. What? Ah! I don't even know where to begin because like everything I could point to would be that. I need, I need to point to a thing. I don't even, oh God. What? What? Ah! Which we'll discuss a pretty good example of in a minute, but it's very difficult. Most people who try to do this just fail because you look at anything that claims- Like this is taking, like it's not quite up there with right-wingers who think that Star Trek is right-wing, but this is pretty close. Like again, does he think when he sees a horror movie and like, I don't know, let's say this, I don't even know what he's seeing. Normally I could see something, right? Because like in Star Trek, you could say like, okay, Steve Shives did a good video on this of what right-wingers might be seeing in Star Trek that they are relating to. And those things are militarism, um, sort of American homogeneity being expanded into space. The Federation and Starfleet is basically just planet America being in charge of everything. Now, of course, that's because it's made in the United States, so of course it has that viewpoint, but like, that's what they see in that. What is he seeing in horror movies that he thinks is antithetical to left-wing ideology in any way, shape, or form? I don't understand to be left-wing horror and it's going to be like some 20th century critique of consumerism and it's like yeah same like who says we like consumerism but john what are you talking about you literally vote for donald trump a man who is the personification of american consumerism gone awry like i understand that you might aesthetically claim that you're against those things but you're not you're not you just want to feel like I'm a young, cool Zoomer Republican. I don't care about businesses. I just care about being a Nazi. No? No, you're a Nazi and you're tied to tax breaks for charge corporations that are also going to advertise to people to buy shit they don't need.
But in criticizing consumerism, of course, they really mean to criticize capitalism because obviously leftists are not anti-consumerism. Leftists are actually the let people enjoy things crowd. So those two things aren't mutually exclusive, I think, in different amounts. You can both recognize that the way that our system is structured is not a good thing, but also enjoy things that exist within a system. This is the meme of like, uh, you criticize society and yet you take part in it curious like i'm not against markets inherently and i've talked about this before there's this weird thought that like people who don't like how our system economically is set up that somehow i want like one brand of things and the government picks you know what movies get made and what toys get made for children no i'm not against markets at all i think markets can be a great economic tool it's just they shouldn't be the primary economic tool that's only ever used and you don't regulate things. I just don't want a system where businesses and, and, and people who produce things are fucked over by a small class of ultra wealthy people who are stealing the fruits of the labor of people who do it. Like, I'm not saying in the future if, if a system was more in line with what I would want, I'm not saying businesses wouldn't exist. They would just be structured to be for the benefit of everyone working in them and the person buying things as opposed to being a very pyramidal structure where it all exists to please either shareholders or the boss. I don't think that's hard to understand. I think we all implicitly kind of get that our system currently is built in a way that it serves very few at the expense of everyone else. It's something we all recognize, I think. It's not that. He did. He did. He, he did the soy jack. That's how you know. That's how you know. It's interesting to me, as someone who went through the phase of, in like over a decade ago, seeing the Rage comics be a thing, and then the soy jacks came, and soy jacks are just Rage comics again. And now we're coming to the end of that where everyone knows they're cringe, and I've used them because, of course, it's part of the cultural zeitgeist. But, like, you know... Is this really a productive mode of conversation? <laughs> it's just that they're class insecure and they're projecting that outwards onto the world. Because Syndicalism, I believe, is an anarchism with markets. Uh, I th think also a defining feature is labor unions and trade guilds being a primary political force. Is nobody serious on the right? I could be wrong, though. Right is against criticizing capitalism, but it's very difficult for leftists to properly critique capitalism because their motives for doing so are not disinterested because they're driven by resentment. And so they'll highlight, what is this? John, I own a house. I have a pretty good job. I have a collection of things I enjoy. I have health care. I'm living my best life. There's nothing in my life currently that makes me like bitter or jealous. I'm fine. Do you know that you can criticize a system without being bitter? Because you're criticizing a system. Such a weak justification. Consumerism, or they'll highlight material inequality, both of which are to basically say, I'm mad that I don't get to buy things that other- I buy plenty of things, John. Again, see all the horror movies that I have, which is why I understand them better than you? I buy plenty of things, John. I'm fine. I just don't want to live in a world where other people around me are going without. I don't want to be in a world where people are impoverished, where people are poor, where people don't have access to education, clean water, food, where children don't have an opportunity to learn in a safe environment where they can get, you know, fed and treated well. These things are not radical. They should be the foundation of a basic functional society other people get to buy by the way i know i'm pausing this constantly but john's just one of those people he's all we're covering today until we get to rem lazar later by the way we are doing rem lazar for the subathon goal at around 5 p.m that'll be on twitch that'll be on twitch which is affirmed clearly by the fact that every time one of these people finds a way to make a living being resentful about inequality, they always keep it for themselves and just go buck wild, which I don't care about. Like, I think there's tons of things to very rightfully point out in the online left with big creators like Hassan, right? What does it say when someone who spends their time and money building their career talking about inequality and they buy extravagant things? I understand that even if you're critical of the system that we live in, that if you dumb, do come across wealth, 
even if you share most of it, I get it. You're a human being. You're going to want to get some stuff for yourself. I don't think that's inherently wrong. It's not your fault the system is fucked up. But that's a fair conversation to have. At what point do you cross the line? But I also think that's a bit of a red herring. Because how many people like Hassan are out there? Very few. The vast majority of people online on the left who are, like, talking about stuff like this are people like me or smaller. I make a living doing this. I'm not wealthy. Far from it. So it just feels like a weird thing you're pointing to that doesn't have a systemic relevance. And also, I would argue, I don't think, for the most part, that being... How do I put this? I think that wealth makes you a worse person. I think that human beings have impulses in us to be selfish. So... I don't think it's surprising that anyone who all of a sudden comes across a lot of money, like Hassan, who makes a lot of money per year, all of a sudden maybe not behaving in line with their conscience. This is one of the things I think maybe is a disconnect because John is a right winger. I think that our system primarily is broken due to systemic issues. I think that anyone who gets access to that much wealth and continually is able to make money by just sitting there and using their capital to make more, I think that is perverting. I think that is destructive to who you are as a person, regardless of who you are. I would be the same for me. If I won the lottery tomorrow and I had $100 million, I would probably become a worse person for it. Don't get me wrong. I'd use plenty of it to help people, but I think just having that much money and power isn't a great influence. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is it's fine to point out criticisms with individual people, but at the end of the day, the bigger issue is that the way our system is set up, that anyone can get that incredibly wealthy compared to other people. That's the problem. That's the problem. You know, do what you're going to do, but... We can't let these people think that they have any moral claim to- Hassan having a nice house is a great way to refute what the far right claims communism is. I don't see that in any way, shape, or form. And I think here we're seeing exactly why that doesn't work. That's not how it's perceived at all. It's perceived as hypocritical. Any issue we face, even capitalism, which we still win the debate on against them or neocons or whomever. Yeah, he's not wrong about that. Like, I'm a leftist. But the idea that anything close to a majority of Americans have a sour opinion on capitalism as a whole, I don't think that's true. Younger people, yes. Older people, no. And so this is the problem, and this is common with a lot of movies in general nowadays, where they'll use the traditional themes of a right-wing horror movie to serve an ultimately progressive agenda. What's a right-wing horror movie? By just plugging in a bunch of left-wing nonsense into them. What? Like the actual components of the story, the mechanics of it, how they affect each other, those don't convey a left-wing message. I own a house. I do. It's a single family home. It'll just be like Candyman. Again, you understand that I'm not saying he can't own a house, right? Hassan has like a very bougie house. Black people have a tough time. Whites are evil. Get out. Is that really what you got from Candyman? That's the entirety of the message and nuance you got from the film Candyman. Good God. Oh, whites are evil. John. What? You should even like Get Out. Get Out is a criticism of liberal racism. It's so funny that you seem to not even get that. Like, has he seen the movie? You'd think he'd be all over that shit. You'd think he'd be all over that shit. Because let's say, let's say I'm cynical. Let's say I'm John, and I want to, you know, make a, a video where I just shit on the left for no reason. I do, because it does have explicit themes about, like, progressive racism. The parents who are like boomers or Gen X or whatever, who are liberal but wealthy and fetishize black bodies. And this is exemplified too by the constant discussion of like, oh, I would have voted for Obama a third time if I could. It's that, it's that racism of like coddling. It's, it's racism of lowered expectations or racism of fetishization. I don't know how to describe it. But if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. The movie isn't about, like, right-wing, backwoods, racist confederates. It's about wealthy liberals who understand sort of the rhetoric 
of anti-racism a little bit and understand that like being a KKK member is wrong, but they've gone so far that they have continued to dehumanize black people by treating them as vessels that they can take and commodify and steal, right? It's directly a criticism of like so-called progressivism and it dealing with racist issues poorly. Like, I don't even understand how he missed this. This was like a perfect, he could have easily said that whole thing and I'd be like, yeah, I can't, I can't disagree with that. That's what the movie's about, yeah. But instead, he just got white people bad from it because he's a fucking idiot. <laughs> and black people have a tough time. Whites are evil. Get out. Whites are evil. And it's not the what? Alien. Female protagonist. Therefore, girl. Po Alien. Why did you use that poster? Okay. Alien also came out in like 1970. Oh, God. I don't know where my alien copy is. Alien came out in, like, the late 70s. Are you calling it woke? Because Sigourney Weaver is the main character at the end and in the subsequent films? Evil. You lived with a very conservative guy for a while because roommates. It was amazing how he missed the obvious message in so many movies and shows. It was absurd. Huh. 79? Thank you. Get out. Whites are evil. Alien. Female protagonist. Therefore, girl power. Like, maybe in the... What? Again, Alien is, and again, I know this is 79, so we don't quite have the slasher genre down pat yet, but the idea of the final girl, which the first Alien movie is effectively a slasher film in space. I don't know if that's how they sat down and thought about it, because again, Halloween was, oh gosh, Halloween had recently come out. Um, it's a 77? 78. 78. And of course, it had been predated by other progenitor slasher movies like Texas Chainsaw. The idea of the, like, the final survivor being a woman is a common trope, to the point where it's notable when it's not the case. For instance, um, in Nightmare on Elm Street 2, famously, there is a male sque scream queen, because um, the protagonist of that film is a man, and that is the film that is considered the gayest horror movie, or one of the gayest horror movies. It has uh, themes of coming to terms with being gay. The ending, unfortunately, is shitty. But anyway, like, this was so notable, he literally had a documentary made about him. I... His literacy of the tropes and trappings of the genre are so bad, I don't even know how to explain to him the final girl isn't woke, it's just the trope. And usually it's because in society, we tend to view women as very vulnerable for obvious reasons, because women are in a lot of danger from day to day because they're surrounded by men. Uh, again, not telling anything about you specifically, just in general, you know, you never know the men around you if they're safe people. So women are often feel and are perceived as vulnerable in society. So when you're making a movie and the structure up until the climax, you want maximum tension in your horror movie. So a way to do that is to have the main character or final girl in this case, be a woman because there's that extra layer of vulnerability as opposed to when it's a man because culturally people view men very different in these situations. Men in stories in the West are often viewed as having more agency because men are imbued with agency in stories more often. I don't get it. I don't get it. Clyde, thanks for two months, says, I'm here, I'm queer. Me too. Thank you. 60s or 70s, you'll have something that was vaguely anti-war, maybe, and so they'll claim it, but it's always just the little details. It's like icing on the cake or whatever. And, you know, they're just horror movies that maybe are accented with depictions of colonization, oppression, classism, inequality. If anything, the final girl trope is patriarchal because it's usually a woman who projects her or protects her purity, aka isn't seen having sex, and she survives because she's, quote, good. That is often a trope. And I don't know, I I understand why that is a thing in horror movies. I feel like Halloween often gets saddled with this trope when the first movie I don't think is even trying to do that. 
Like, Michael Myers kills a decent amount of people, and I don't think it's because they're having sex. He just likes to kill people. Lori Strode doesn't survive because she's a virgin. She survives because she's smart. Like, if you see her characterization versus um, her friends who get murdered in that movie, like, quite explicitly, especially her one friend who just says totally all the time, is supposed to come off as a little air airheaded. I, d I don't mean that disrespectfully. It just feels like that's <laughs> what they wrote when they <laughs> wrote this character. Um, you know, she just says totally. And one of her friends is like, books? I never do anything about books. I never bring my books home. You know? So I think Lori isn't supposed to be the virgin as much as she's supposed to be a more responsible teen that's looking towards adulthood. Like, you can even see in scenes in the movie, um, there's a scene where she hears screaming and she runs to see what it is. And it's just kids. It's kids playing. And she goes like, whew. And she smiles at the kids. A lot of it's a movie about the loss of innocence and that step into adulthood. You know? I don't know. I think it's more complicated than that. Friday the 13th, that cemented it. Friday the 13th absolutely is all about the people fucking. Friday the 13th did that. I blame Friday the 13th. Final Girl, the board game is pretty good. Oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Etc. But at that point, those are just cosmetic features. Like, it would have to be at its core. I like the ending of Cabin in the Woods. Like, I like all seeing all the creatures escape and stuff. But after I saw it the first time, I kind of got what it was doing. I was like, okay. Eh. <laughs> I like all the lab scenes. The cabin stuff isn't as interesting to me. Or left wing. Or a lot of times a movie will be left wing just because of how vulgar and subversive it is to our cultural standards. I still haven't seen the Terrifier movies. They don't look good to me. I've heard not good things. And I like gore. I'm fine with gore. But I also like the gore to be in service of a story. And I've heard that the Terrifier movies are just super gory with no point. And well, this clown, whose name I don't know, because again, I haven't seen the movies, he has a great design. That's a great design for a slasher villain. Like, that's perfect. Awesome. I've heard his personality is awful. And that sucks. I've heard it's just not good at all. <laughs> They're very bad movies. That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. And they'll take pride in making something like that. So... Sometimes it's left wing in the sense that the message is progressive, but in a much more real sense, it's left wing because the message is retarded and subversive and defiant to reality. Or a lot of times it'll just be like you took any dozen classic horror movies, you reduce those to an aggregate template, and then you just make that movie a hundred times, but you just cycle between the villains. Like, okay, this one, the white people are scary, then the colonizers, then the men, et cetera, et cetera. It's just lazy. It's just like bloodlust porn for libtards. Wow, he is just doing so much ableism today. Here's a link to this video for no particular reason, by the way. In case you and we don't get out. to make movies like that, depicting our enemies with all the caricatures, all these insane scenarios. We like what, John? Name it. Name the scenario. Because I feel like what you're describing is probably the film Birth of a Nation. You just actually have to live with them and observe their behavior. And you know what the biggest... Yep. This irony is the biggest fans of horror movie consumerism are libtards like the oh wow it's almost like you don't understand the genre and it's actually a genre just absolutely full of left and progressive messaging hill count guy loves gore but gets mad if a movie objectifies women uh y yes that's not hypocritical Treating women like objects in a film, which is indicative of a general attitude of sexism, is different than gore in a movie, which is literally a special effect that has no bearing on your, like, view on human beings? Yikes, my guy. Can we maybe not do that? You're... That would be great. Dumb. Yeah, me when a cameraman focuses on a woman's body. Uh, I disagree with having to see this. Just... John, I think it's more to do with gratuity or... Mm, let's put it this way. If it was more even, right? If it objectified male bodies the same way it does female bodies, I don't even think a lot of people would have a problem. Have you met millennials and Gen Z people? We're all horny. Like, I don't know a single person of our age that has a problem with sexual content when it's done, you know, in a non-gross manner. Like, we're all fucking horny. It's just that objectifying people without their consent or in a gross way 
is yikesy and makes us feel bad. And no, John, it's not some sort of like virtue signaling. It just legitimately is like, oh, gross. Like we feel that for real with our feelings because we're human beings with empathy for others. You might want to try it. Say you're gay. Like we could have a whole discussion constructing a model of these types of people because you'd think to yourself, okay, why are all the biggest diehard fans of these McHorror films, which contain terribly violent things in many cases happening to people, uh, why are these people the same people who would pride themselves on being so empathetic and so understanding? Wow, John really, his psychology, like if I had a degree in psychology, I would just want to study this man. He has a fundamental misunderstanding of basically everything. He thinks that watching, like, for instance, I don't know, what's a gory, gory movie? Let me pull out something really gory. Okay, here's my Saw collection. This is, uh, including all seven films. Yeah, this is the one through the final chapter till Saw 3D. These movies are incredibly gory. In fact, they got the uh, derogatory name torture porn. The thing is, John, the stories are interesting and the horror part is both thrilling and fun because you know it's not real so for instance in the first saw movie these people are trapped in a bathroom and they have to saw their foot off right we're not going yeah saw your foot off or if you do it's because it's like fun in a movie like if this is a real thing horrifying but that's the point it's a horror movie it's a way of experiencing something scary and unpleasant in a safe place. That's like a huge part of horror movies is that they usually reflect societal or individual anxieties and tell a story with it, or at the very least create a safe fictional space for you to experience those feelings. I don't know, maybe that's above your head. Bet he's a hostile fan though. Oh, he probably loves Eli Roth's movies. Especially uh, Cabin Fever. You know how many slurs they use in that movie? <laughs> and the answer is because what these people get off to, above all else, isn't being empathetic and understanding. Get off to? Like, it's like he thinks empathy and understanding is something you have to put effort into doing. Like, it's an activity and not just, like, a passive thing that you have. It's being empathetic and understanding to people who seek to subvert traditional American society. What? No, it's about being empathetic to anyone who doesn't want to harm people, John. And it's not even, I would say I do feel empathy even for people I don't like. Like I feel empathy for John. I think he's a bad guy, but I don't think you need to be, you know, a genius to see that there's stuff going on underneath the surface there that is not healthy. Like, John's a bad guy. He hurts people, and I still feel empathy for him, even if he doesn't deserve it, right? It's like he thinks empathy is some sort of, like, political strategy instead of a normal part of being a human who isn't a sociopath. It's the same thing with the movies, which are in many cases made for the sake of being as brutal and disgusting and gory as possible. You look at the people who really like those movies, they're all leftists. And it's because... They're fun, John. They're fun things like does he think they're real like if we were watching snuff films i would agree with you but we're not it's fiction because they get off to the vulgarity and the offensiveness of the material sure there there's a certain level of subversiveness in horror i would say but like gore isn't even subversive it's been a thing in movies for a really long time there's definitely like tom zavini has been retired i think for a while he had a whole ass career in the time that you're talking about a component to it that's just about channeling the natural instinct to see violence that we all have with them in I don't know about that one, John. In particular, there's probably a dark spiritual component to it as well. What? But I really believe that they just love subverting what they regard to still be. Nah, uh, John's a Zoomer. He was born in the year 2000. In a position to be subverted. So it might seem like there's a hypocrisy or a double standard. There isn't. You just don't understand the genre. <laughs> to their behavior, but there isn't. Like, it's all directed at the same 99, enemy. 99, sorry. Which is just us. That's he considers himself a Zoomer, so that's what I go with. It's honestly the worst part of it to me. Not even, like the subversion or the edginess, but that it thinks it is. December like, 99, yeah. It's just this cringe faux edginess. Like you've got these people and they're just beating the corpses of moral authorities that have been dead in our culture for a while. They're trying to act like it's so edgy. Bro, did you just attack Christianity? Are you attacking the nuclear family? You're attacking men? You're attacking white people. John, I don't know if you know this, 
but um, people in this day and age still get treated badly by the church for being like gay or a variety of political reasons, unfortunately. So do you think that the church doesn't have power over people, especially in like the South or places where the church plays a more prominent role in the community? Do you think that people don't still feel like white male homogeneity is pretty prevalent throughout like governmental structures around the world? A little weird. Again, a little weird. I've said this before. Even in this stream, I said it. Recently. Horror movies are ref a reflection of the anxieties of their viewers, or at least of their creators for an audience that hopefully will relate to them. And horror movies that are successful usually either are just well-made filmmaking-wise, or they strike a chord in terms of the themes that they promote. So if we are seeing an uptick in films like the movie Men, for instance, or Midsommar, you know, have you considered that the reasons for that you have backwards? Have you considered it's not artificially produced in order to give an air of anxiety, but those anxieties actually do exist deeply within a large portion of society, and you just don't understand that because you don't listen to people different than yourself? Yeah. Opinions of Scary Movie. Um, I remember liking the first one. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me there's like a super transphobic scene or something. But I haven't seen it since I was a child, literally. I don't own them. Like, a lot of those movies are just not great. Oh, wow. Look at that face. <laughs> Hold on. I'm gonna snip that. That's pretty good. That could probably be an emote. <laughs> oh, God. Sure, that. John Pog. Ow! Dude, that's so, that's so punk rock. That's so transgressive. What are you going to do next? This guy can't be stopped. It's like, this is why it's difficult John, to be left with. John, how would you describe power structures, like, around you? Like, do you think that the power structures around you that you perceive are all very gay and non-white. I guess you must, you're right wing. So yeah, you look up at other people in society existing openly and you take that as oppression even though they're not really in power. Interesting. I really am just thinking about this. He thinks that the public existence of like non-white people, non-Christian people, trans people, gay people, whatever, is like, an affront to him and that that is some sort of authority deserving of subversion even though it's not an authority or any sort of systemic issue it's just the existence of people different than him that makes him uncomfortable and he considers that confining huh that's unhealthy horror because so much of what we understand horror to be is about the unnatural threatening the natural order and so much of oh my god what Okay, I think I understand the fundamental thing he doesn't understand about horror now. Trey Risen with $10 says, I'm just sitting here at work thinking about how much of a better argument I could make for right-wing interpretations of horror films. It doesn't, it's like he doesn't even like them, but he knows others do. Okay, I understand his perspective that he's viewing this through. So he views horror films as the unnatural encroaching on the natural. No? No, they're not. And this is a very right-wing thing of looking at this because the right believes in natural hierarchy. They believe that there is like, oh wait, was there a tip? Oh, shit balls. Um, Jacob uh, with a hundred, <laughs> hundred uh, dollar tip says sexy Freddy. Holy shit. I probably do need to put that on, don't I? Fuck. Okay, it'll take five seconds. I'll be right back. It's appropriate for this anyway. And I was supposed to do a costume today. Give me five seconds. I'll be right back. I'll put something on for you guys. <sighs> we might have to do Rem Lazar slightly later, but that's okay. Hmm.
Okay, I'll be right back. Hey, there, folks, and uh, welcome back. I guess it's starting to be that spooky time of year. Special shout out to my friends in Spookane, Washington. <laughs> anyway, special thanks to Discord member Batman for sending me the world's hottest hot sauce. Look at that thing. Comes in its own little casket. This has 2.7 million Scoville units in it. 5 million! 5 million Scoville units! Well, that's, uh, that's double the amount that I was prepared to ingest. So, a couple of special things about this episode. One is that the ingredient was bought and paid for by someone else. Cha-ching! And last thing about this hot sauce, we're only going to be using one drop of it. We're, ju we're just going to do it without the meat loading tray until I can figure out how to get that grinder thing off. You think I care about safety? Get out of here! By the most, with the rhythm take you over by the most. This thing couldn't be more porky if it ain't at me. And before we add our one drop of sauce, we're gonna fill it up with some salt, a generous dollop of uh, pepper, a little garlic powder for the folks at home, and now we decap this. I hope there's a. How do you open it? Are there special instructions on how to open this thing? This, this doesn't seem right. This seems like the opposite of right. I didn't realize I had to watch a tutorial on how to open a bottle of hot sauce. That's hitting glass. Just open! Mrs. Sausage! Cancel my afternoon meetings! I'm doing it. I'm do- Oh. I'm the smartest person alive! Ha ha! You thought- Oh, no, this is just this is just making a mess. I can't open it. Woo. So good news and bad news. The we good did it. news is I got the top off. The bad news is I totally destroyed the cap. The the reusability of this hot sauce is like now zero. I'm not I'm not here to complain about hot sauce bottle design. I'm here to complain about the strength of hot sauce. One drop and there it is. It smells very extracty. This is a cat sneezer for sure. You're out of touch. I'm out of time. But you're out of my hand when I'm not around. a sausage. Whoa, whoa. Good song. Wow, no pork water. That's pretty incredible. And three. <laughs> Boom. All about the pork water. One. Let's sausage. Hey, yeah. Guys. Whoa, we over, we over, oh, look how much we overshot. The perfect amount of casein kid strikes out again. With special thanks to today's Mark oh. Boxalo box art, this guy. That was my elbow cracking. Man, my mustache was in its prime. This little blow is brought to you by Mantis Sleep. Mantis Sleep is back and better than Cease. ever. Promoting their Blow to Mark Ruffalo's. Here we go. Okay, uh, I think it's done. It's uh, my my nose is running from this. But let's open this up and see how we did. Uh, looks normal. Looks like a plain old sausage. Why is this legal? Why Why is there no cap on the amount of spice you can put in a sauce? This is insane. I truly believe people that like really, really, really spicy food are doing it to show off. They're, they're, they don't mean it. They're suffering in silence. Here we go! I agree with that statement. Holy. I can't even do mild uh, sauce. Is the sausage getting some water? It's, it's, it takes a second. At first, uh, oh! Hold on, I gotta run upstairs. Don't get water, get milk. Get milk or ketchup or mustard. That's it's, it's inedible! Who is enjoying this kind of hot sauce? If you tell me in the comments that you enjoy this kind of hot sauce, you're, you're a liar. Way to go telling everyone you're a liar. Oh, I can smell a lot better now. What? 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 Why? Why? Okay. Why? And that was one drop. That was one drop. I can't, I can't eat it. The heat took like a good 
to Mississippi in order to start burning. It tastes like fire. That sauce is the hottest thing that I've ever tasted in my entire life. I can't. He hasn't tasted me. Can't imagine who would enjoy a sausage like this. Certainly not me. So uh, I'm I'm gonna have to give this sausage here uh, a half a point. Jesus. All right, back to John Doyle's bullshit. The leftism is just unnatural, and you can manipulate the audience's perception. Of the leftism leftism is unnatural. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. So if you missed the part before we did the pause so I could put on the Freddy outfit, um, John was saying that he views all horror through the lens of, quote, horror is like the unnatural encroaching on the natural, which is such a bad definition. However, it does encapsulate conservative worldviews in general. The idea that there is some sort of natural hierarchy, men on top. John also, I would imagine, thinks white, straight men on top, and then, you know, buh, 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 down whatever they think people are deserving of their role in society. So he thinks that that's how the world works, and that anything that is against that is subversive and evil. So he's applying that worldview to horror movies that don't function on that logic. And he's doing a poor job. That explains why he doesn't understand them, because he's looking through an entirely wrong filter. Two things. Firstly, Trey with $10 says, I'm just sitting here at work thinking about how much of a better argument I could make for right-wing interpretation of horror films. It's like he doesn't even like them, but knows others do. Oh, maybe I did read that one. Very true. Um, Clyde, thank you for gifting 10 memberships. Oh, Baja got one. Very cool. Very, very cool. We do have memberships. Uh, if you want to be able to gifted, be gifted a membership, you do have to turn it on in the settings, just so you know of the story by highlighting certain characters and events in different ways but when you really think about these stories and what's going on anyway let me i'm gonna pull out a few examples i the freddy gloves fun but it is hard to do during the stream so i'll take it off okay examples of things that are in no way following what he is talking about the one that's right next to me american psycho literally a film about patrick bateman a white straight cis attractive man who's successful and wealthy the most natural thing i'd imagine john can think of and he's a serial killer he uses his role in society in order to murder people and con them that's not something unnatural that's something very natural texas chainsaw massacre how is that unnatural? It's literally about a group of people going through Texas and they find a family who's been devastated by economic downturn and industrialization of the meat industry who have turned to cannibalism. That's not unnatural. That's literally a discussion about economic like situations in rural America. Like, what are you talking about? What? <laughs> like, I don't even know what he's... Like, literally that would only apply to like supernatural horror movies where demons or ghosts or something show up, and that's not most horror movies. Um, it's hard to see how they're accomplishing what they think they are. Like when you watch one of these movies, we're typically rooting for the maintaining of the normal order against some outside threat, against some- Right, but the thing is you consider gay people an outside threat and normal people consider lunatics with knives stabbing people to be an outside threat unnatural or sometimes when we are rooting for the bad guy it'll be when he's you know killing degenerate teenagers or when he's punishing bad people and of wow he really has a fucking warped view of horror movies like don't get me wrong i like freddy i think those are fun movies i like jason they're fun movies but i'm not sitting there thinking to myself like haha die sluts like that's that's psychotic that's that's just 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 so untenable and weird Holy shit, Clyde, another 20 memberships. Holy shit balls, thank you. <sighs> John, you're not, you can root for the horror villain in the sense that the effects are fun and you know that's the point of the movie, but if you're genuinely casting moral judgment on the teenagers, you have a fucking problem. Like you can find them annoying. A lot of characters in slasher movies or horror movies are annoying or immoral, and I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about sometimes they'll have a character. Good example. Sleepaway Camp. Sleepaway Camp, the first kill in the movie, 
that isn't the boat thing at the beginning. That's an accident, though. Um, the first actual murder in the movie involves a cook being cooked. Um, and that, the movie foreshadows because the cook is shown to be a creep. He's a pedophile. So in the movie, he gets his comeuppance, right? Not every movie works like this, but a lot of them do. So, like... There are certain movies that set up certain characters to be evil, so their horrifying deaths are comical instead of, you know, tragic. But that doesn't mean that every person in a horror movie that gets killed, you're supposed to, like, cheer and be glad that they died. Uh twisted form of vigilantism, something like in Saw, which is inherently right-wing, by the way, that whole idea of the vigilante, because the outsource... I agree. Saw is one of the only right-wing horror movie franchises. I would agree. John Kramer is inherently, and I'm not saying that you need to view them this way, but John John Kramer, Jigsaw, is right-wing. His ideology is right-wing. That's one of the things I like about the movies. He's the villain. Like, he's out there, and he thinks it's his job to sow retribution or teach people lessons so they learn the natural order or whatever. You know? He doesn't think people have the innate right to human life. He thinks they need to earn it. So I would agree. John Kramer is a right-wing horror villain. But you're also, you know, he's the villain. <laughs> like, John Kramer has literally put people in traps for things as petty as they smoked cigarettes, they self-harmed, they have some sort of addiction, they're literally just the spouse of someone who is cheating on them, or they are abuse victims who weren't able to escape the abuse. That's one of them in Saw 2. Like, John Kramer's a fucked up right-wing vigilante murder guy. I would agree. Forcing of justice. But you're not supposed to like him either. And Hoffman, don't even get me started about Hoffman. Oh my God to capable citizens presupposes the collapse or the decline of the liberal order, which can no longer sufficiently protect it. Wasn't John Kramer mad at the healthcare system? Um, specifically, the, not the payment. It was because, um, actually, it was the insurance industry. Um, um, and it was because they were being shitty. But he's still a right winger, especially because he kills one of the people because they smoked. Michelle Gladio says, conservative always conflate natural with moral, but only selectively. You know what's natural, John? Bonobos engaging in metric tons of gayness. It's people in deliver. Oh, maybe the domestic abuse victim was Saw 4. I've seen this, all the Saw movies except for Spiral. Um, they kind of mesh together in my head. They're not my favorite franchise. For justice, and honestly, I think that's why in the last decade or so, these superhero stories have become so extravagant with their villains and storylines, because broadly speaking, if it were still just about criminals, people might be compelled to think about, you know, the world we live in a little bit harder, uh, what we choose to let people get away with, how it affects our society, who these people are, things like that. So instead, it's about space aliens and time travel and quantum physics and the multiverse. I mean, that's a lot of comics marvel comics do that or whatever not a perfect comparison but there's still some truth there but yeah there's an argument that they'll make which is that the genre is left-wing because it's inherently subversive and vulgar and it goes against repression in terms of the i don't think inherently left-wing is the way i would put it but i think by and large the genre in the united states has been progressive throughout its existence that doesn't mean everything in it's progressive that doesn't mean all of the people involved in it are or all the messaging is i'm just saying I see a larger proportion of progressivism, um, especially from like the 80s, 90s onward. Um, but even early on, like I said, James Whale, there were subversive things in horror, especially before the Hayes Code. The content, that does happen, but it doesn't have to happen. It's not required to fit the model that we're talking about. But that's why when you look at the types of people who really love the movies that are made purely for the sake of being disgusting and horrifically violent, like for that in itself, it adds up. So, I don't know. The bottom line is that for the profile of the average horror fanatic being a leftist to be used as evidence that the genre is in itself inherently left-wing, that would require me to concede that leftists are reliable narrators and not completely misaligned with reality, which I won't do. Also, Irony. I did the research. I looked up lists of left-wing horror movies. They're all wrong. Like, they'll take any movie and be like... Oh, did you look it up on Conservapedia? Because the only place I know that has a website like that is Conservapedia, and they're hilariously wrong. 
surplus repression of patriarchal capitalist societies. And it's like, it's not that deep. I heard some people say parasites. Uh, my, my, <laughs> my teacher said the curtains being blue means something, but I'm super smart. So I just think they're blue. You're literally making fun of, of an, analyzing a piece of media. What are you even here for? It's a good example. I guess it critiques class or whatever. I would have to see it. The problem is though- Oh my God, why are you even talking about it if you haven't seen it? What are you doing, John? For He's so overconfident. He thinks he can make judgments about movies he hasn't even fucking seen. For it to really be good. The arrogance of this fucking man child is so funny. Good it has to ultimately tie back into something that exists in the real world. If it's just drawing from or inspired by- Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hmm. By a fake narrative in society that's completely untrue, like most of these left-wing horror movies do, it's not really doing what it's trying to- Oh, that's from the movie Men. Good movie. Do it's you okay? Oh, you're standing on the heater. I see. Basically nothing more than- Took me a second, because you were just like, it's like, oh my God, why? <laughs> Propaganda. It's like that tweet, guy who's only seen Boss Baby watching his second movie. I'm getting a lot of Boss Baby vibes from this. It's like the same thing with these people. They're so consumed and preoccupied. With John, you have not in this video so far expressed an actual opinion that was based on like, look at this movie. Here's why I think it's that. With these fake narratives that they see a movie which echoes them and they're like, this is just like real life. This is like really smart, actually. This is- John, people having different perspectives on the world than you isn't ignorance. I don't know why you think that. Please cease. This is a lot about society. Or John, why do you presuppose that people are forming their opinions on society from the movie and not the other way around? It's almost like you just assume that your political enemy are all stupid because you have really biased views of women and progressives in general. However, critiquing class in Korea is a lot different than critiquing class in America, but the libtard mind, it cannot conceive of this because- they John, do you understand that even if things aren't a one-to-one -one translation, that themes, especially these days when we live in a pretty globalized society, and we're not talking about like a movie from, I don't know, <laughs> I'm trying to even think. Like we're not talking about a North Korean movie that maybe comes from a society that's very different from our own. South Korea, well, of course it has its own rich cultural background. Primarily the movie is about capitalism and like hierarchical structures of class. And South Korea has capitalism very similar to the United States. They're one of our closest allies. Like our systems function very similarly so the idea that any criticism or any position taken in that movie can't be translated or looked at even a little bit is stupid. Gnome Pickle says, hey, remember when this video was about John reviewing movies he liked? When is he gonna do that? Hopefully soon. They look at South Korea, which is comprised virtually of all ethnic Koreans, and they look at America and they're like, I don't get it, like we have two. John, you're the one making this a race thing. You're literally saying, well, it can't apply because America has different races of people. He's literally just saying that he thinks that inequality is race and not, you know, that racism is part of the reason that inequality is doled out the way that it is. Jesus Christ. Two countries of individuals. Why can't we just compare these? So... Yeah, I would have to take some time and, and really compile a list, but I don't think it's possible generally, especially nowadays, to have truly good left-wing horror films. I think that notorious shitlib Stephen King got it right when he said the entire genre is inherently reactionary. Something like Smile is a good recent example of this, actually, which honestly I thought was a good movie where it's like, yeah, it's scary or whatever, but the ultimate message is about oh, generational trauma and passing it down and mental health and healing and growing, which is like... It is a movie about... Mental health, delusion, losing touch with reality, how we treat people that we view as delusional. Yep. The whole liberal understanding. Like it literally just comes down to John being like, the things this movie is talking about are too complex for me and I don't like that because they're thinking about things and my worldview falls apart if you think about things outside of a strict hierarchy that was taught to me by a 2000 year old book. So, uh, 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 
insert ableist language here in order to stop thinking about the actual complex nuanced issues of the world so John can feel comfortable in his weird hole of nonsense he's constructed for himself over the years. Uh. ...of human psychology, so that was pretty crazy. Squid Game is from South Korea, yes. But, but he thinks... I, I, did he do the video where he thinks Squid Game is pro-capitalism or was that someone else? I did appreciate at the end where they were basically like, LOL, psych, it never goes away, so. Yeah, a lot of horror movies do that, John. Who knows, maybe the director's our guy, but yeah, that's their formula. They want to take the general themes of a right-wing horror movie and then just plug their moralism into it, particularly with- Name a right-wing horror movie. Bloodlust stuff against whichever villain is due, which contextually does make it left-wing because then it's meant to inspire resentment towards the remaining living impediments to their agenda. But the class-based stuff doesn't really do that as much. Like that movie is ultimately trying to say, oh, inequality is bad. But then it's like, okay, that's not left wing so much because of that, but more so because it's like delusional and insane. Or they'll also <laughs> what? Also say that horror films became more left wing when the source of the evil shifted from being some outside threat, a creature, a monster, whatever, to being inside of us. Anybody could be brought to this point. Oh my God, John, that's literally not even new. You're acting as though Psycho's the first film to do that. Clyde, another 10 memberships, wow. You are being incredibly generous today. Thank you. And thank you for everyone in chat getting a membership. John, I love Psycho. I absolutely love that movie. And I love the conflict that goes on within Norman Bates. I think that shit's great. Not the first movie. Not the first movie to deal with um, internal issues. Like even going back to adaptations of things like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? The Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. You think these films don't deal with introspection? Man versus self shit? God damn, he's dumb. And maybe that's supposed to subvert our understanding of morality and conduct. John, it's not about subversion. Like, do you not understand that there are people who deal with, like, mental health problems? That there are... I, I don't... Like, what is his deal? Does he just want every horror movie to be, like, a, a drag queen <laughs> coming to town and stabbing children? Like, that seems like that's what he wants. He wants a movie where his perceived enemies are casted as villains and that their destruction is conceived of and the end as a good for society. That's hilarious. But that's not the part that does that because right-wing people are not optimistic about human nature. So what makes these stories left-wing isn't so much that they shift the evil uh, to us rather than them, it's that they take it farther by trying to basically excuse the evil, attribute it to environmental factors, make us sympathize with it. John, understanding the underlying cause for people's behavior is important actually. I understand you're stupid and that complexity isn't good for your brain meats. But that's why you're a douchebag on YouTube who makes a video like every five months and I guess probably sustains himself with daddy's money instead of being someone that anyone takes seriously. And basically view morality overall as less objective and more circumstantial. And John Carpenter had an interesting take on this, which I disagree with. John Carpenter would fucking hate you. I don't even think John Carpenter would necessarily like me. John Carpenter does just doesn't like anyone, but I think he really wouldn't like John. Actually, but we're getting too carried away here. But yeah, it's sort of meta, I guess, <sighs> like horror movies are right wing. Horror movies can be left wing. Horror movies that claim to be left wing are incoherent, which makes them right wing because the ultimate takeaway is that liberals are retarded, which is in alignment with the natural order. That's the takeaway with one of these movies. You know, it's like the message is not what is intended, but wow, imagine believing something so f stupid that you actually produce a movie about it crazy these guys are just as bad as i thought all right time for your self-improvement advice <coughs> got a little bit of a cold doy boys but it doesn't matter sometimes you can make your day a whole lot better and more enjoyable by changing something small like wearing comfortable clothing and for you guys it starts with your boxers that's why I did that underwear say infantry and waistband that's a lot The genre, etc. Attack today at underattack.com. Offer code Doyle twenty. Very epic. We can. I I do appreciate that he's telling his audience to finally change their underwear. That's nice. Continue. 
This is not going to be a thorough analysis, by the way, of like right wing. Holy shit, Clyde! Another ten memberships. Themes and horror Holy as a genre, crap. et cetera. We can do that later if you want. This is going to be fun. If we learn a thing or two along the way, great. Uh, all right, so. Get Thank you, Clyde. You're just making it rain. Getting started in no particular order. Got to start with this one, though, because it's a nice transition from what we were just talking about. Number one, Halloween, the original John Carpenter film. Oh, boy. Hold on. I need my prop. <laughs> I own all of the Halloween films. I know more about them than you, John. From 1978. Funny story with this one. I've always loved horror movies. I remember the first time I saw this, I was with my dad. I think I was maybe like seven or eight, honestly. I'm gonna guess he didn't find it scary. Uh, and he'd been telling me for my entire life, this is the scariest movie ever made. Never do that, by the way. If you're a fan of horror films, in particular older films like Halloween or The Exorcist or whatever, and you have kids that are old enough to start, you know, watching movies like this, don't build stuff up like that. Don't be like, this is the scariest movie ever. That's not how this works. Just because you found it scary as a kid doesn't mean a kid now is going to find it scary. You probably want to find something accessible before you start getting into something like Halloween, which a lot of younger kids are probably going to just find boring because it's a movie mostly about building suspense. I don't, I don't know how much tolerance young kids have for that. I wouldn't have had it when I was really young. Like, I love Halloween now, but, you know, if I was, like, eight years old, ten years old, I'd probably be like, this is the most boringest movie. When does the stuff start? So probably start with something more accessible and then work your way into stuff like that. People were walking out of the theaters when this came out. I don't even know if that's true, but we started watching it. I was so freaked out by what I thought was going to happen that I... I think I only made it to the part where Laurie's like walking home and then Michael Myers just like emerges from this bush and then goes back behind the bush. And I was like, okay, can't do this anymore because I got myself so worked up about what I thought I was going to see. But I actually have a similar story. This is the only time I'll ever um, actually have a similar experience to John Doyle probably. <laughs> One sec. The, f the first slasher movie I ever saw was Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. And I was relatively young, but I had heard about Freddy Krueger, you know? I knew about Freddy Krueger as a character. Um, so like in, in your head as a kid, things like that are so frightening because it's an adult thing and you just don't know. And I worked myself up so much that this scared the shit out of me. Like, I don't know what it was, but like this scene. Da, da, da. Oh gosh, I don't know if, it's probably fine. Dun, dun, da, da, this part with Freddy, just this him, on, something about him being on the TV and then the TV stuff turning into the wall scared the shit out of me. And I had to pause the movie for like 20 minutes because I had recorded it on VHS because it was like playing on like HBO at like three in the morning. So I had recorded it and watched it later in the day. I don't know, just him getting sucked in the TV creeped me out. Anyway, not a scary movie. <laughs> yeah, the original Halloween from 1978. In a garden of If you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it. You've had plenty of time. Xandris, thanks for becoming a member for two months. Essentially, it begins with a six-year-old Michael Myers killing his sister on Halloween night, 1963, with a knife that he retrieves from the kitchen after he's left at home with her and she's messing around with her boyfriend. His parents come home. Let me he's guess. standing outside dressed. John is going to say uh, parents not being home and being parents and allowing their daughter to be a insert sexist bullshit slut shaming here which led Michael to, in his confusion about sexuality, stab her. It's gonna be something stupid like that. Dressed in a clown costume with this look on his face, still holding the knife with his sister's blood on it, and his parents take off the mask and just imagine what they're gonna see when they go inside. Uh, really quickly, people will say that the whole slasher genre is right wing because the victims are typical. I don't think that's a typical belief. Like, I think that there's discussions about the problematic elements of slasher films throughout the 80s and 90s that often had an emphasis on um, the sexualization of their female characters in particular. 
I think that's fair, but the idea that the entire genre is right-wing, I have never heard anyone really expressly say that realistically. Teenagers who are partying, sinning, dabbling with the occult or whatever. There's something to be said about that, certainly. Just like there's a lot of stuff out there already analyzing different sci-fi films through this lens, particularly with the us versus them motif. But I want to focus on some other components, which I think are worth discussing here. So this opening scene, very iconic, and it depicts well what a lot of people will say is the left-wing transition uh, within horror films starting maybe in the 60s, but definitely in the 70s in the 60s again i remind you in the 30s frankenstein and its sequel stories about monsters basically which often and john might not know this but uh monsters have often been you see this taken to its fruition in guillermo del, del toro's uh the shape of water which is one of my favorite movies i love that film but monsters are often stand-ins for outsiders. James Whale, who directed Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, was an openly gay man in the 1930s. The themes of those movies of being targeted for otherness and not understanding your place in the world and feeling like a monster because that's how people perceive you, those are LGBTQ themes. Like, I'm not saying that's the only read on that movie, but it is certainly a pretty evidenced one. So the idea that somehow progressivism or left-wing ideas only found their way into the arts in the 60s is so funny. John, do you know how many progressive people are in the arts? <laughs> Avant Gardner, thanks for $2 which is that the evil comes from within. It can be anybody, et cetera. And John Carpenter, actually, who directed this film and wrote this film, uh, was also called the master of horror. He said something interesting. Didn't Deborah Hill have a part in co-writing this or did she co-write the second one? Hold on. Halloween writer. She just the producer. Written by John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. Okay. I assume he's just not giving Deborah Hill credit because she's a woman. Interesting about this, which we just to be clear, he's the director, he and Deborah Hill were co-writers. Alluded to, so I'll play that right now, so take a listen. It's one of the two scary stories that we, we can tell. One is the evil is inside, or the evil is outside. Right-wing evil is always outside. It's them, different color skin, different way they talk is different. Now that goes way back to us tribal we're sitting around the campfire, and we've just come out of the trees. And the uh, the witch doctor says, "I'll tell you." Jesus where Christ, Clyde, you you're giving more subs than I even have viewers at this point. Gives twenty more memberships. Thank you. Evil is it's out there in the woods, in the darkness. It's the next tribe, and they're going to come in here, and things will be impure, and they'll take you over. That's right-wing evil. Left-wing evil, same situation. We're sitting around the campfire. Witch doctor gets up and says, I'll tell you where evil is. It's right in here, and he points to his heart. It's in each of us. We have the capability to commit evil. The good man chooses not to and fights against those impulses. The reason his model doesn't work is because the right-wing view of human nature can actually fit both of these models, which he assigned. I would argue the left-wing one can too. Like, progressivism in the left is not blind to outside enemies, far from it. Look at what we're doing here. I do a whole show where we look at right-wing people. The difference is that we understand that there's a reason for that evil often. Not a good reason, but there is an understanding that anyone could have wound up like John Doyle or other bad people under the right circumstances. That is scary. That's reality, is that people are the way they are due to a variety of factors, and all of us are capable of evil. All of us are capable of hate. Being better than our base instincts, being better than some sort of maladaptive coping mechanism that makes you want to lash out at others or be afraid of them. That's part of being human, is being the best version of yourself. That doesn't mean you don't recognize enemies on the horizon. It means you understand those enemies better. 
Um, $5 Super Chat says, Shelley was the child of progressive English uh, academics. She absolutely intended Frankenstein as a commentary. His eyes are the window to his kind soul. Even bringing up Shelley in, in this case is kind of funny because the Universal um, Frankenstein movies bear very little resemblance to the original novel. Um, they're basically their own thing. But I get what you're saying, for sure. Signs individually to the right and to the left. Like what he says about left-wing horror, that we're all vulnerable and it's only through strength and discipline that we can choose to be good. That's not left-wing because that is a... I would say that it is because we care to understand systemic issues and the reason people are the way they are. A skeptical view of human nature. That's right wing. The left wing. View no, it is not. Introspection is not the right's uh, cup of tea. View of human nature is that people are basically good. Uh, and when they do. I don't know about that. I think humans are complicated. <laughs> I think we're capable of both good and bad. I wouldn't say we're primarily one or the other. Things that aren't. I think that's so reductive to the point of not even being worth discussing. Good, it's because of socioeconomic factors, neurochemical imbalances, which they can't control, etc. Because since we're all the same, if people behave differently, well, it can only be because they were introduced to circumstances which compelled them to do that. We're all not only, but yeah, primarily that is how people work. People aren't robots. Usually we are responding to our environment and factors around us. Yep. God damn it, Clyde, another 10. All the same function, we just get different inputs and that's unfair, so we have to address that at a societal and institutional level. It can acknowledge wrongdoing only within the- Glad we're not on the subathon anymore. ...context of ultimately <laughs> placing blame for that wrongdoing on something that is external, something that's totally separate. And conversely, left-wing horror, like we mentioned, can still use those themes of us versus them, subversion, etc. but they will do so in service of ultimately vilifying men, white people, Western civilization, etc. so- No. It's not so black and white, I don't think. And the reason we know this is true, by the way, is because in his own movie, Halloween, when we get that shot of young Michael Myers, that's what he's alluding to right there. Like that the evil can be within anyone. It doesn't have to just be within some out group. It could be with- Yes, Halloween's themes are primarily that of pure, almost the, the, the platonic ideal of evil. Like not everything makes sense. Sometimes people just snap and things happen. That does happen. Not often, but it does happen. It's about an empty evil that you can look in the face and there's nothing there. It's about banal destruction that doesn't even come from a sadistic place, almost like a force of nature. It exists only to destroy. So you could put a lot of different meanings into that metaphor, but overall, I firmly reject you saying that that's somehow lazy or inaccurate because we know for a fact that there are things and people within this world that harm others just cause, why not? And if not even people, events out of our control, systems out of our control. It's the same idea as a Terminator, you know? You can't bargain with Michael Myers, you can't beg, it means nothing to him. Like he might not, we don't even know what his internal thing is, if he has anything at all. In a peaceful Midwestern suburb. Okay, well, what is the rest of the movie saying though? Who are our protagonists? So the rest of the movie follows Dr. Loomis and Lori. Michael Myers is sent to an insane asylum following the murder of his sister, 15. There's even an argument you could make, and I wouldn't make this, but you could certainly do this, that says that, oh, if you want to get deeper in the first Halloween movie, which this is a little bit what Rob Zombie did, and I don't, like that. I think Michael works better as a motiveless evil. But you could argue, okay, he was sent to an asylum in like the 50s <laughs> and then spent 20 years there where after about 10, his therapist gave up on him and just started treating him like an animal. You know what I mean? Like, like again, it's a movie, so obviously the intent was not this. But you could argue that Michael was failed by a system that was supposed to treat him like a human being and figure out what was going on, but instead was treated by his therapist as if he was just evil and undeserving of any real help. And therefore he didn't receive help he needed. I don't think that's an accurate thing, but you could make it if you wanted to. 
15 years later, Dr. Loomis is there to escort him to court to see if he's gonna- <laughs> Michael Myers is possessed, John doesn't understand. Let's just, let's forget about the Thorn cult. Let's not do the Thorn trilogy. They continue to be incarcerated. Michael escapes, he steals a car, and the rest of the movie is Dr. Loomis trying to hunt him down while he terrorizes a bunch of small town teenagers, kills people, and at one point I think he eats a dog. Very general outline, but throughout this movie there are several frustrated moments where Dr. Loomis has these monologues where he's trying to communicate to people that he's been watching Michael Myers for the last 15 years. He's the epitome of pure evil. He cannot be reasoned with or rehabilitated. He must simply be stopped or else he's just going to keep hurting people. And so the reason it's right wing is just in the way that it treats Michael Myers, particularly with his relationship to Dr. Loomis, who, may I remind you, is technically a mental health professional. It's like the Mystery Grove tweet, right? You know? Not technically, he just is. He's a doctor. You know, you look at modern horror, whether it's Smile or the Babadook, and it's like, oh, wow, this is such a smart metaphor. We just all have just this generational trauma, and if we repress it and don't heal and grow and take SSRIs, and we risk passing it down to others, versus Dr. Loomis just like, hmm... I'm going to medically diagnose you as evil and then... Yeah, I don't think Dr. Loomis is definitely, like, again, in the movie, like, Michael is evil, but he's not representative of, like, most people. He's a metaphor. Uh... And shoot you with a gun. Like, that's awesome. That makes sense to me. Oh, Michael Myers just needs a social worker. No, he needs to be shot. Do not read too deeply into that. But I'm just like, the point is it doesn't matter if the evil is coming from the out group or from within. It's, it's a way of understanding evil that says, look, we have to be realistic about this person. Hold them accountable. They're not a victim. They were not victim of some circumstance by all. Of but that is the story of Michael specifically. He isn't. He's like... I'm trying to understand how broadly he's painting this metaphor. John, this is not supposed to be indicative of all crime or all antisocial behavior and how you treat it. Michael is very specifically a metaphor for non-human evil. Like he's not really a human. He is, but like not really. Oh God! Well, parent measures. This guy grew up in a very nice home with a very, with a very nice family. He murders his sister still, and he's going to continue murdering people. Like we have to deal with that. The liberal understanding of psychology, incarceration, it focuses on mental. John, most people are not Michael Myers. He's not a real person. Mental health being harmed by trauma and prison as a means of rehabilitation, which is ultimately saying none of this is really your fault. You just had bad luck, bad circumstance. I don't and think so that's try true. No. People make terrible decisions all the time. Those can be affected and are affected by their circumstances, but that doesn't mean people aren't culpable for their actions. You can have a system of incarceration that works on rehabilitation while also recognizing that that person made choices. But the idea that those choices aren't in any way affected by their circumstances is ignorant. Like people generally steal because they need money or food. They don't just do it for fun most of the time. And if someone does steal for fun, that's kleptomania, and that's its own thing that needs to be dealt with. Try to correct this in the meantime by giving you pills, putting you in jail. But once we make society equal, none of this is really gonna be necessary since nobody would ever just do something bad, except- John, that's not what anyone says. That is such a straw man. White men. It's Maps and Mimics, thanks for three months, says ironic that just shot him is what makes sense to John and is seemingly his preferred approach seeing as this that explicitly doesn't work. <laughs> that is so true. Michael keeps coming back. It's almost like unless you deal with the root of the issue, this just keeps happening. It's only when they're put into tough circumstances that they do bad things. Yeah, okay, well, uh, it's not how that works, but it doesn't even consider that some people might be just like that. Some people might just be impossible to rehabilitate, but if- John, using some sort of outlier and acting as though it is the norm is the problem. I am not saying that there are no people who are psychopathic or sociopathic and choose to harm people. To be clear, not everyone who's a sociopath or a psychopath is like that. I get that there are people who are benign with diagnoses. I'm specifically talking about people who choose to harm people and don't care. Those people exist. They are a very small portion of overall crime or overall antisocial behavior. Most people don't harm people or steal 
because they want to just be shitty. They justify things to themselves. What are those justifications? How do they come to those justifications? Do they need something? Are they hungry? Are they impoverished? What's being done about that poverty? Do they have opportunity to get out of this situation in legal ways? Again, he just doesn't want to ask questions. He just wants to be like, nope, just shoot people. Shocking that Kyle Rittenhouse is a big fan of this guy. Tapioca and raisins, thanks for gifting a membership. If you want to know why our country is so mentally unwell and so incapable of actually delivering justice, it's because- Justice is when murder- Both of those institutions are governed by those orthodoxies, which are ultimately just- I'm sorry, John, do you believe that in our country, the justice system is generally uh, left-wing? You believe that the system that we currently have is left-wing and based on rehabilitation and not punishment. Who boy. Ideological and delusional. And the reason I know this is true is because you look at the evolution of this story, Halloween. Look at what happens in the 2007 remake, the Rob Zombie version. It's the completely opposite depiction. Well, yeah, that's just because Rob Zombie doesn't understand Halloween and is a shitty filmmaker. It's the same story, same general happenings, but it totally cucks. It shows young Michael Myers getting bullied at school. His household is abusive. His family's poor. My nurture, my nurture, my so Yeah, I don't like that movie, John. Socioeconomic factors, my generational trauma. It's like, it's a way of telling the same story, but it's trying to make us sympathize with Michael Myers by beginning the story showcasing him not as a killer, but, but really as a victim of circumstance. Give me a break. And again, I'm not unsympathetic to horrible circumstances. I acknowledge fully that people can be dealt horrible hands throughout their lives, even from birth, but our society is based on acknowledging. He just chooses, you know, not to care about that. And sort of agreeing that despite that, we're still going to be civilized. That's literally what defines civilization. Kind of easy for John to say that, isn't it? When he's like a Nepo baby whose parents have always been pretty well off, it seems like. Lives in a pretty wealthy suburb, or at least did when he lived with his parents. Somehow able to go months at a time without making any videos, but he's financially secure. I'm sure it's pretty easy to say, hey, 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 sure, people are unequal, but can't we all be civilized? when you've never wondered where a meal is coming from in their life. I would bet that John has never once in his life been like, fuck, I'm hungry and I need food, but I don't have money. I don't think that's ever happened to him. And that's really the critical mass, I think, for your maturation. Like, when you realize that nothing is fair about life, nothing is just. Nothing is fair, says John, the upper middle class white kid who's been doing YouTube as a career since he was 16. <laughs> and you can either spend your entire life resenting that or you can try to just make the best of it. Like being a- Again, John, you are a privileged person, as am I in many ways. Recognize that you really can't come from a place of privilege and be like, well, people who aren't should just deal with it. You didn't have to deal with it. I didn't have to deal with it. So like, maybe be a person with empathy who doesn't want other people to unnecessarily suffer when we have enough to go around where we can help people and help people improve their own lives. A man means that nothing is your fault, but everything is your responsibility. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you don't try to seek justice and make things fair when they are so obviously not fair. John, anytime people do that, you just call them cucks or other bullshit things you call them. But what tends to happen is people want to just use their circumstances as an excuse to treat other people unfairly and to do the wrong thing. And that's just not acceptable. And that's the problem with depictions like these is Won't that they're someone clearly- think of the property damage to the target? Intended to make us sympathize with criminals. And when you have a media ecosystem that's saying, wow, you know, criminals are just like you and me, except, well, they've had a hard life. And then you've got a political ecosystem that is defining criminal justice reform as going softer on these people. What that equals is more innocent lives being taken because these insane ideological commitments are just festering throughout our institutions. And so that really does highlight the contrast between the two films being, you know, the 1978 version, the 2007 version. That's really the true dichotomy which John Carpenter seemed to be trying to articulate in terms of evil, which is whether we are made to be inclined to excuse or sympathize with evil behavior or otherwise be inclined to to question our moral values. And the original doesn't do this, but the 2007 version does do this. And there was a guy I found on YouTube who was talking about this. He managed to get it exactly backwards. I, I have to play it for you because it was so wrong. It, it actually like needs to be studied. Just take a look. The way I'm gonna use this idea is to look primarily at the horror villain and to try and determine whether they come from an outside force or whether they're from within a community. Let's start with Carpenter's slasher Bible, Halloween. Who is the bad guy? 
Does evil come from within society, or are they other? The way I see it, the opening scene answers this question pretty well. The film opens with a POV murder, a shot that says almost literally that the evil on screen is coming from within. We see the suburban setting, and that the person committing the crime is native to suburbia. So the- I would say that both are about evil coming from within, but one just tries to explain it very specifically, which is stupid. Evil- I don't think either version is about evil coming from outside of us, from them. Making this a dichotomy between the two versions I think is false in the first place. They're both about internal evil, one just strives to explain it comes from within that community. Michael Myers is from the neighborhood in which he kills. The suburbs of Haddonfield, even the Myers home itself, are practically indistinguishable from any other suburb in North America. It could happen anywhere. It could happen in your own community. That's- This person needs to work on their delivery. No offense. That's why Halloween is so special. It's just a little stilted, like they're reading from a teleprompter. <laughs> Special. Ding ding. Halloween 1978 is left wing horror. Okay, so this is the same problem. It's like, yeah, I get what you're saying. I get the point you're making, but the model is just incorrect. Like, maybe at the time it was subversive and left wing to depict suburbia and human nature this. Yes, because it was made in the 70s, correct? Why are you. Yes? You have to watch a movie in the context of the era it was made. Like, the message is going to be obscured to you, or at least the intended message is going to be obscured if you try and view it from whatever your current lens is. And that can be a perfectly valid reading, too, to be clear. You can look at a modern lens in an old movie and find new things in it. That's not a problem. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about authorial intent, it feels like. This way, but taken into the broader cultural context, how this film treats evil, it really it just doesn't hold weight. Especially then when you look at the 2007 version, which really makes everything fall apart. Of course, this is where his argument disintegrates. Take a look. By contrast, Rob Zombie's 2007 remake of Halloween depicts Michael Myers, his family, his home, as outsiders to the Haddonfield community. The f That, I think, just comes from Rob Zombie's style. I don't know if that's intentional. I can see where he's coming from with this, because Rob Zombie likes to depict trashy, <laughs> angry, yelling people. So I can see that. But again, they're still living in Haddonfield. I still think it's internal. The film is a cruel, blunt instrument set out to undo anything that was frightening about the original. Rob Zombie has a way of pointing his camera at his subjects in an almost hateful way. It feels like he's pointing at someone and saying, ew, look how gross and f***ed up this person is. The Myers home in 2007's Halloween couldn't exist anywhere. It's the perfect blend of abuse, neglect, and poverty that destines Michael to be a cold heart. It could never exist anywhere. Oh. Hearted killer. It couldn't be anyone. It couldn't happen anywhere. It happens because everyone around Michael is cruel to him. The Myers family does not belong in this community. They are clearly outliers. I don't know if I agree with that analyzation, analysis, whatever, but okay. And thus, I'd argue Rob Zombie's Halloween is patently right wing, not to mention the weird anti sex worker stuff in this movie. They undercut Michael's first murder with his mother pole dancing at work, as if to say, see what you did? Your kid is a murderer because you're a sex worker. I don't even know if that's what I got from that. The use of love hurts is really weird in that movie, too. Either way, bad fucking movie. If that ain't some right-wing bullshit, I don't know what is. Okay, do you see what I mean, though? It's not right-wing because, oh, the Myers family is the other. Oh, they weren't accepted in their community. Yeah, like, probably for a good reason. Have you seen the way these people are behaving? They're, like, pretty much the worst. And it's not Michael's fault, but, at a, you know, it's like he's experimenting with killing animals. I'm not really concerned about whose fault that is, per se. Just stay away from my family at that point. But that only works if you subscribe to the model being whether evil is coming from within or from the other, which I don't because it's wrong. And this is the problem with these people as a whole, like, why they love things like I source... I think it's less about one or the other... Because I think I think most I think virtually everyone recognizes both as truth. The problem is John is trying to make it a right wing thing, and he thinks John Carpenter and maybe John Carpenter is trying to make it a left wing thing, on the opposite side. I think the vast majority of people both recognize in this day and age, hey, both yes, other people can be scary. Out groups, politically, socially, can be scary if they actually are trying to harm you, right? But you can also understand that there's an underlying psychology going on. There are sociological reasons groups form and form around certain ideas. Why is that? I would argue that, well, both the left and the right have these concepts 
in their head and agree with them. They put emphasis on different things. The left is more about systems and reasons why things are the way they are, whereas the right is focused on just what they consider symptoms. That group. That group's bad. They have no care to really understand the underlying reasons. And any of those reasons they give are based entirely generally on bigotry and their view of society as inherently, naturally hierarchical. This is an expert so much, they cannot independently think <sighs> through things. And so they need some information, some framework to be their like authoritative frame of reference. John, yes, having a framework based on actual study is a good thing to do. That's literally how human beings have strived to become more intelligent over time, is trying to understand systems that surround us, whether it's about physics or math or sociology. Yep. All these nerds trying to figure things out. Why can't they just want to shoot people they don't like, like me, John Doyle? And that will then guide them to conclusions, which are typically absurd, but that would never occur to them because they arrived at them from using the expert framework. But again, this guy is incapable of understanding that because he can't see the world through that lens. He has to view it through the lens of class, discrimination, people being mean. Did you just shame a sex worker, my dude? Uh, yikes. Try being a decent freaking human being. And you can tell because of the way he unnaturally tries to. Yeah, don't be a dick. You can make fun of people calling you out for being a dick. Don't be a dick use the word ain't and it just sounds forced like they always try to mimic the behavior and language of the lower classes to create some sort of sense of solidarity it's just very weak behavior but fucking what the bottom line is whether we are going to make excuses for individual behavior or if we are going to hold people accountable for the choices they make regardless of circumstance if we're going to be confident enough in ourselves to make those moral indictments and honestly assess whether some people are simply beyond rehabilitation that's why halloween 1978 is implicitly right wing moving on number two Coraline. Probably have seen this one, very fascinating, great soundtrack, great animation style, it's based on a novel. And essentially the plot is that this girl moves into a new house with her parents, they don't pay enough attention to her. So she starts exploring, she discovers this new world that seems to be a mirror of her world, except everything is fun and perfect. And oh my god, he's gonna be like, it's a stand-in for liberal concept of utopia, but underlying it is sinister intent. They want to absorb you into their liberal hive mind and give you button eyes. They'll promise you welfare, but they're they're going to they're going to steal your eyes. And her parents spend a lot of time with her, etc., but eventually she learns that things actually aren't as good as they seem and her new mom He's doing the thing. Um is trying to get her to give up her eyes to stay with her there forever. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Yeah, you're trying to say that uh, the left wants to trick you with, um, um, you know, promising good things, but in return for these, they want you to blind yourself to the, quote, reality of the situation, which I assume is what you consider your right-wing hierarchical beliefs, which you think are the truth. Is Coraline actually an anti-trans allegory? One second, baby birds, I will oh. feed you. You know, I actually thought about including Sleepaway Camp because the big scary plot twist Oh boy. At the end of that movie, it's just that the girl who's killing everybody is actually a boy. And back then, people saw that and were like, wow. Uh, or maybe even Silence of the Lambs, you know, Buffalo Bill, homicidal transvestite who wants to wear women's skin. Which The movie literally says that Buffalo Bill isn't trans. Hannibal Lecter says that. He literally says it, John. Of course, literally never happens because there is no overlap between serial murder and LGBT identification. You know, in general, I think it's okay. Correct overlooked how significantly the widespread commercialization of the true crime serial killer genre that whole thing has contributed to the erosion of trust levels in society which isn't to say it's the largest factor but it's still interesting especially because when you examine these types of stories under microscopes with the strength to extract the details necessary to satiate the detail hungry masses he hasn't watched the movie it wouldn't surprise me you're probably right it almost always reveals patterns of deep sexual perversions being demonstrated by the killers. Like these same guys, Dahmer, Gacy, etc. These same guys who get off to doing stuff with dead bodies, using body parts to pleasure themselves, getting off to the act of killing in general. These guys also got off to doing things that we're told now are perfectly normal and natural. And if you notice it, these guys also wore pants, ban pants, pants cause murder. Any patterns you are on to These people drank milk. Milk causes serial killers.
psychologically evil. No, hey, I'm not I'm not Michael Myers. I'm just a sensitive young man. Okay, excuse my behavior. I mean no harm. I'm just saying I get to I get to just say I reserve that right. But you can't ignore it's all basically just a sliding scale of sexual depravity. I mean, there's a reason that all lasting societies have placed very strict standards on sexual conduct. Famously, Rome was incredibly straight. The dangerous Pandora's box to open, or to be open-minded about, so to speak, but... Greece, too. Also, Hannibal Lecter, he's got a pretty good line, too, in the novel. I don't think he says it in the movie, but basically, Clarice Starling is trying to get him to fill out this questionnaire so she can evaluate him psychologically and try to establish a profile for future use. Are we talking about the movie or the book? And he says something like, oh, Clarice, do you think you can dissect me with this little tool? And she's like, um, no, but it might provide some insight into what happened to you and to what made you like this. And he's like, nothing happened to me, Clarice. I happened. You can't reduce me to a set of influences. You've given up good and evil and exchanged them for behaviorism. You've got everybody in moral dignity pants. Nothing ever. And then we find out that there was something that happened to him. He was forced to eat his sister by Nazis anybody's fault look at me can you bring yourself to call me evil and that's pretty based it's kind of like in halloween and obviously it's not that black and white in reality but it's a lot closer to this than what we're supposed to believe now and what we're being conditioned by virtually every institution in society to believe about good evil individual behavior etc but anyways Coraline, this was inspired by a couple posts that sounds like he looks up to hannibal he probably does he probably looks up to all these fucking shitty villains you're not supposed to like like uh, patrick bateman put up on my Instagram story a while ago where I posted a photograph of a teenage girl showing the results of what's referred to as top surgery, which is when I'm not dealing with the transphobic shit. Not worth it for any of us, to be honest. Things where people think it's left wing because it's critiquing capitalism, which is largely to say it's critiquing usury. And it's like, yeah, same. You know, I remember at the time people on the right were freaking out about this. They were calling it communist propaganda. And is John doing the thing now? Now he's going to say Squid Game is right wing? Oh boy. Anti-capitalist propaganda. We really just have to stop viewing these things through such immature lenses. These very like sophomoric dichotomies where everything is either co John, you're literally doing the thing. Communism. You've been doing the thing the whole time. Or capitalism, individualism versus collective. Atheist Brony with $5 says, how come your notifications have been popping? Oh. Hey, okay, there you go. Yeah. Vism, et cetera. Like we wonder- I don't use that Discord anymore. Why we can't make culture on our sides because most of us are just illiterate. The reason this show is ultimately right wing is because what it portrays is natural and honest about human dynamics, particularly- What? Particularly between men and women during these high stakes, life-threatening situations. Like there are no girl boss characters. No, like the only way women- What? and survive is by being deceptive and cunning, seducing men, things like that. Whereas men tend to advance through just brute strength, ability. So that's really what I'm concerned about. Like, is this piece of media lying to me about human nature? Are you trying to make normal things that are so obviously not normal? And you had everyone at the time, everyone on the right was so mad about this show. And then you had some Cato Institute types who were like, well, actually it's, it's right wing because that wasn't real capitalism. That was corporatism, blah, blah, blah. I don't care if it was about capitalism. It can be about capitalism, economic systems, are not what is going to compel me in a story where the stakes are this high. That doesn't make it left wing, I don't care. I'm like Patrick Starr, you know? All the conservatives hated this show, yes. All the liberals loved this show, yes. So that would seem to make the show left wing. It makes sense to me. So Squid Game is left wing. No, it's right wing, you stupid idiot. Like modern society being unable to provide for the average person is not as a result of a decades long incumbent political consensus which reflects my beliefs. Capitalism forces people to risk their lives to pay off unfair debts. Okay, maybe, sure. But also, <laughs> Okay, maybe, sure. <laughs> Honestly, are you telling me that people wouldn't just sign up for this voluntarily? Let's say there's no debt. Oh my God. John, do you understand what a metaphor is? Do you understand? Oh God. No exploitation. It's just open to the public, compete to the death for money. People would- John, the fact that people feel like that's worth it is the point. The fact that we are in a situation where people would potentially do that because they are desperate for money is the point. That's the point. That's the point. That's the That's the point because they let them leave and then they came back voluntarily. If you watch the show, that's part of the show is they come back voluntarily. 
that's the plot of the show. Sign up for that. Because, yeah, people are greedy. They like money. But there is a component of vitality. It's not about them being... It's about them needing it to live. Oh, my God. John is so dumb. Like, I've been thinking he's been going to college or something, and that's why he's been, like, not posting videos as often. If he is, he needs to get his parents' fucking money back, because holy shit, it's not doing him any good. ...to it as well. They're like gladiators. It's a warrior experience in modern society. Yes, clearly, if you watch the show, that's all how they feel, like gladiators. <laughs> Jeez if you want to talk about it, provides very few opportunities for men to channel that impulse anymore. Why do you think the last 20 years of media has been things like, oh, The Walking Dead, Lost, Breaking Bad, the whole post-apocalyptic genre? John, do you think that Walter White is a good guy? All of that media is about- Do you think that Fallout is right wing? men becoming who they are so i'm not saying it's moral to hypothetically construct this competition where people can fight to the death for money but what i am saying is that we have to stop automatically assigning people victim status when they are we have to stop assigning victim status to these people who desperately need money and then are put in a fight to the death against each other in order to get m money what a take what a take perfectly happy to do something, which is different, by the way, from when something's obviously making them miserable and they just pretend otherwise. But I see this a lot from people on the right where they're like, oh, these poor soldiers, they're victims. Wow. Stop the violence. It's all so sad. And what are you talking about? Have you ever spoken to a man before? Constantly fantasizing about taking down muggers, burglars, blue helmets, whatever. After That's bizarre, John. Please go watch All Quiet on the Western Front any of the versions. After Vietnam, we found this out, that a large reason that combat veterans have- Today is Rem Lazar Day. We're doing Rem Lazar on Twitch after this stream. Have trouble readjusting to society after they return isn't because they're just so traumatized. Of course, war changes you, but it's because once you experience the feeling of going to war with other men, that's tough to walk away from. That's tough to- If you are so into that, that you would rather spend your life fighting in a jungle somewhere, murdering people, I don't think you should be allowed back in society. We could drop you off somewhere. Holy shit, John. Just from, and obviously I don't- John has a bloodlust, and it is weird. I don't have experience with this because our military doesn't fight wars for Americans anymore, but- Yes, but I'm so curious when you think the last war that was is. I'm assuming you maybe think Vietnam? I don't know. If we did something like- I'm not sure how much credence he puts into domino theory. I don't know, militarize the southern border. I would sign up overnight and you can hold me to that. Do it. Do it, John. Do it. My point is just that if somebody thinks they've been victimized or they give the appearance of that, that's one thing. But I see a lot of people trying to assign victim status to soldiers automatically. And it seems to be from the usual suspects who would do it just because they're afraid of male behavior and what that's capable of. If you define male behavior as murdering each other and feeling nothing, then holy shit, I've never been happier to not be a man. But anyways, yeah, the director says, oh, it's a fable about modern capitalist society. Who cares? People degrading themselves for money? Sure. But if I made a version about how modern capitalist society forces people to degrade themselves for money by becoming sex workers, well, all of a sudden that wouldn't be so left wing now, would it? Right, because you're specifically casting aspersions on the sex worker act as opposed to the overall system, right? You're not doing it because system exploitative. You're doing it because you don't like women using their own bodies to make money? That's the difference, is the actual target of the criticism. Gnome Pickles with $5 says, as someone who has actually been in violent and scary situations where it could have been the end of my life, shut up, John, you know nothing. Also, it spends a not insignificant amount of time focusing on these elite sex parties and rituals. The left never really likes to talk about things like that. The billionaires at the end? John, that stuff's great. That stuff's great. Do you think that we don't know that ultra-rich people are fucking weirdos? We, we know. 
we don't like billionaires. I talked about this earlier in the acquisition of wealth being a corrupting force, and when you have so little limitations on yourself that you're that rich, you're probably a fucking weirdo. They like to ignore it or dismiss it. And I honestly think it's because they're like offended by the idea of sexual abuse not being democratized. Like why do only- What? Only the elites get to do this. What in the fuck? Why only the 1%? No fair. Like seriously, obviously judging by their conduct, they're not offended by abuse or- gro What? Grooming. So clearly they're just like resentful because they're excluded from it. Resentment of course being at the core of all leftism. Jesus Christ, John, this is some weird projection. So, all right, moving on. Number four, the remake of The Last House on the Left. Very I haven't seen this one. Very importantly. I'm gonna skip it because I can't talk about a movie I haven't seen. I don't think that's fair. Ooh, Day of the Animals. Or evil as like a psychopath or a schizophrenic, like in Psycho or slasher movies, things like that. Or uh, The Revenge of Nature, things like The Birds, Day of the Animals, uh, The Happening. Talk about roar, you coward. Remember that one? Also Satanism, demonic possession, the Antichrist, like in Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, The Omen. You know, we don't really have ghost movies anymore. We have demon movies. And there is some significance to that, I think. Uh, the Child from Hell, right? Which is often connected to the satanic motif. Things like The Omen, again, mm -hmm. Carrie. Uh, then you've got cannibalism, like in the- Carrie's psychic, she's not demonic. Carrie has the shining, basically. In the Stephen King multiverse, which we find out in the Black Tower, uh, or the Dark Tower, um, like the Shining is a thing, like psychic powers are a thing that pervade the multiverse. Like psychic energies exist. So like Danny from the Shining, Carrie from Carrie. If you see someone in a Stephen King story that has some sort of psychic abilities, it's all the same thing. It's not demonic. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes, Night of the Living Dead. It's Etc. And all these motifs, even though they seem somewhat separate, they can all actually be unified and drawn together by one unifying force, which is the family unit. And in the case where the connection to the family unit is the most tenuous, probably the revenge of nature, that motif as a whole, that ended up being the least successful and productive in comparison to the other motifs. And in the more successful example, mm, it goes through cycles. Sometimes there's... There are slasher booms and busts. There are paranormal booms and busts. Um, it just depends. Like the early 2000s were replete with torture porn because that was like a fad. And there were a decent number of like animals gone awry films, but like, or run amok. But there are fewer. Um, I have a whole shelf of them just because I think it's an interesting subgenre that doesn't get a lot of like discussion. So I own like Day of the Animals, Roar, Grizzly, uh, Them, the mantis something, tarantula, arachnophobia, cocaine bear. But like, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, I don't know, people don't interact with wild animals that often, so it's maybe not as visceral of a thing. It can certainly be a stand-in for like environmental stuff, but. Examples of it, namely the birds and squirm, the attacks still seem- I haven't seen squirm to be linked to or drawn out by sexual or was the torture porn reaction to the war on terrorists enhanced interrogation that's actually a good question i don't know you'd have to ask a horror scholar i'm not huge into the torture porn stuff like i like some some of the saw movies i hate i do not like the hostile movies i'm trying to even think what are other torture porn movies those are the main ones i know familial tensions. So in the other ones, the connection between the family unit uh, has been much more consistent. The psychotic, the schizophrenic, the antichrist, the child monster, you know, all these things are- The rat movie with Crispin Glover, Willard. Willard, which is actually a remake of an older film, which had a sequel called Ben. Are shown as a part of the family, whether the family- I'd say the happening counts as natural horror. It's just plants instead of animals family is guilty or innocent like in The Omen. So older horror films were much more focused on monsters. We had a tour of service perhaps with science fiction invaders where the heroes were always American. Perhaps. Yeah, I, I would say human centipede is torture porn. That's fair. It's a metaphor for. <coughs> Excuse me. <sighs> foreign or 
uh, communist infiltration. Good thing that didn't end up happening. But since the 60s and 70s, horror movies have followed the trend of subverting the family unit, questioning its goodness, its utility, its naturality, etc. But in some cases, like the 2009 version of Last House on the Left, it ultimately is good because we see the family unify. Okay, he's still talking about that. I, again, I haven't seen it, so I can't talk. The girl's on her way to, like, can't... Mm. He's talking about the original Pet Cemetery. Closer to that than the uh, the 1972 version, and it also brings back those clear dividing lines, which the 1972 version had made such an effort to blur. In the remake, there are very clear dividing lines between good and evil, whereas Craven made a serious effort to show the humanity of the bad guys and the ease with which the good guys could slip into this violent, manic vengeance and be no better than the bad guys. Is that how you watch that movie? Interesting. We watched that movie differently. And he even okay. said as much about the movie, them doing etc. And the 1972 version has a mother and father just- This is just literally the last thing he talks about. That makes me a little sad that it ends on one I don't have a lot like to say. Like a decade ago, when I went through my Stephen King phase, all I remember is the general- Jen Graham with a five pound super chat says, because I'm having a really good week, I won't go into why, because that'll sound too much like I'm trying to sell shit on Hannah's channel. Oh, well, I'm glad you had a good week plot specifically the way the old guy gets killed and the scene at the end the guy's playing solitaire on the floor by himself in the kitchen i was just kind of like huh that's interesting thought that was only on grandma's computer crazy but then i rewatched that before this video that i almost feel irresponsible including on the list that movie's messed up i mean compared to a lot of stuff that's put out nowadays maybe it's not so bad um it's really not that bad certainly not the most demented thing ever but probably the most demented thing on this list basically what happens is you've got this family who moves to a new place because the dad gets a new job as a physician there's a place behind their property where their new neighbor tells them there's an old pet cemetery where kids used to go to bury their pets when they died the older guy's herman munster by the way Meanwhile, sometimes dead is better. Weird stuff starts happening to the family. A bee sting here, a skin knee there, then this guy gets- Why does he act like he's 40? I think in order to make his parents happy, because his parents, I think, are right-wing boomer types, and he very badly wants their approval. Gets into an accident, he tells the dad to stay away from the cemetery, then he calls him by his name, even though they'd never met before, and then he dies. Anyways- Five out of ten Fred Gwynn impression, hey. I never said I was good. Their family cat ends up dying too, and the dad doesn't want the daughter to be sad, and so the neighbor guy's like, oh, you know, go behind the pet cemetery. There's this Indian burial ground that can bring things back to life if you bury them there. And he tells them that he did that when he was a kid with his dog, but it might be a little bit different uh, when it comes back, but it'll save the daughter from the grief. And so the cat comes back to life, acts all weird and vicious towards the dad. Its eyes are glowing now, whatever. Mm. Then the little boy ends up getting hit by a truck on the same road that the cat- Miko Hughes dies on he's killed and the old neighbor guy's like don't bury your son there dad's like i wasn't gonna and then the neighbor guy tells him a story when some local guy buried his son there after he died during world war ii and basically he came back as like a zombie terrorized the whole town you know typical monkey paw shit everyone got together to try to kill the guy by burning it to death and then the dad was also burned alive in the process by accident and he tells them that he probably awakened some malevolent force by going there to bury the cat, which is probably why the son was killed and he should just leave it alone because sometimes dead is better. The de uh, Clyde, thanks for another five membership. Dad essentially doesn't listen, buries the son there, son comes back to life, kills the neighbor guy, kills the wife who's the son's mom, tries to kill the dad and then the dad has to- Whatever happened to Miko Hughes? I never saw him again after Wes Craven's new nightmare kill his own son that part's disturbing not because of the nature of it by itself but the way they do it It'd be one thing if the dad was like you know ka-chow one and done this is the one thing i won't spoil you got to go see it he basically like tricks the son and makes him pass out and the way the son reacts is just very unsettling just go watch it but he does that burns the old guy's house down which is where this all happened and then immediately he takes his wife's body back to the forbidden sandbox and the ghost guy from the earlier accent he's like no don't do it and he's like trust because i guess he thought it would work this time since less time had passed since she died whereas the son it had been a couple days or whatever and of course it does not work she comes back like a disgusting zombie right at midnight and then he starts making out with the dead wife it's one of the worst things i've ever seen it's a horror movie john yep this is how some of you mfers be though bro i can save her bro she's different just totally switching up and deserving the consequences so yeah she of course immediately picks up a knife and kills him and then the movie ends very interesting behavior.
So as I'm sure you've gathered, this movie is about grief and ultimately trying to, in desperation, conquer nature and play God. Does that make us sympathetic to the poor choices of the dad? Sure, but ultimately we see that there are bad consequences for these poor choices, so I don't think it's subversive because it just affirms what we know is true and real. And it really is a theological story too. It's trying to mimic and pervert the resurrection of Christ, but because only Christ can resurrect from the dead, only he has that power, what results instead is abominable and sinister. Like you choose to utilize this occult version of that in a moment of weakness, and then you realize, after all, it's not the same thing entirely. I mean, the devil and his servants, of course, are gonna promise you one thing, and then when you invite that into your life, you learn- John, it's not the devil. Holy shit. Learn that it's just gonna torment you. And that whole sequence really is a ritual. I mean, you're giving the body of the deceased to be absorbed by this Indian demon. And in return, of course, it just punishes you, obviously, which I do kind of appreciate actually, like participates in indigenous culture literally one time, immediately the worst thing ever happens. So true, Stephen King. This continent is so plagued still by the remnants of pagan ritual human sacrifice. That's why the no Gnomes don't reveal themselves to us, but some people say it's about faith versus reason because the doctor isn't religious. He's got these conversations with his daughter where he's much more reason-based, so to speak, when she's asking about the afterlife. So to speak. Life and God after her cat dies. And then it's supposed to kind of contradict this in this moment of desperation because he has faith that burying his child will bring him back. But that's not really faith. Like it brought the cat back. So he knows it's at least conceivable. But I wouldn't use that word because you're just trying to play God. So it's like you have faith, but in what exactly? Like what powers are you entrusting? Apparently the supernatural ones, John, it's a movie. Stephen King is not religious. Why do you think he doesn't tend to write God into stories as an existent force? I think that's a good idea. You're participating in the occult and faith in God would say, definitely do not do that. But reason as a moral would say, well, if it's possible, why can't I do that? I want my child to be alive. He currently cannot consent to being realived, but I can reasonably infer that he would give informed consent if he could. Therefore, this procedure is ethical and good actually. So I will proceed. Ha. Ha, stupid idiot, you made out with a zombie and then you died and we all saw it. It's literally like over for you. This is your average reason enjoyer, by the way. Literally, I've seen it. These are the kinds of women that the John Doyle ankle biters are interacting with, by the way. But yeah, there's a lot of dialogue in this movie questioning why God lets people die, why it's his choice and not ours, etc. And even the dad who buried his son, who then came back as a zombie, old neighbor guy says to him, God help you. And he barks something back like, God never helped me. I helped myself. It's like, okay, well, look where that got you. I mean, you helped that's a pretty common theme in stephen king stories is rationalism versus the supernatural again stephen king is non-religious and i'll even say it comes a bit um on the nose in a lot of his stories but that's a pretty common theme to yourself by yeah he mocks fundamentalists a lot it's one of his common like stock characters is the fundamentalist character which honestly gets a little old. Like, I like Stephen King. He's got interesting ideas, but he does have certain stock characters that he uses over and over again. The religious extremist, the alcoholic writer. <laughs> Maine as a state is just its own character. By putting your faith into demons, you can't do that, you can't play God, you can't try to transcend death. It's always gonna backfire, but it does raise- The hubris of man is an incredibly common horror trope and sci-fi trope literary trope in general. Some interesting questions about what life really is, what really is death. Do I tend to prefer Stephen King film adaptations to original books? Personally, I like movies in general better. Uh, the, uh, Stephen King's prose are really fun to read, but here's, uh, my thing is, I think I've told you guys this, I can't picture things in my head easily. So like one of the reasons I love movies is because it shows me things I can't normally see. Like, I can't picture things. So when I'm reading a book, I'm listening to the words, but like, I'm not coming up with pictures in my head for what's happening. So I tend to like movies for the novelty of being able to see things that I can't otherwise. But like, the stories in the books tend to be better, but it just depends. It's a film by film basis. Let's put it that way. You know, if you can replicate someone's consciousness, is it really them? How can you tell? What if you can't tell? Does it even matter? Who knows? These are man-made horrors beyond my comprehension, but we see a lot of this in our culture now. I don't actually have full-on aphantasia because I can get an image in my head of simple things for like fleeting moments. 
aphantasias, you literally can't see anything. But, like, a common example is think of an apple, and I try and think of an apple, and for, like, a second, I can kind of get a flash of, like, okay, but I can't see scenes, I can't really create people in my head, I can't, I can't have a continuous movie in my head. At best, I can get a flicker of, like, a still image. With AI, all these medications and surgeries and transplants, makeup, editing, abortion, all this stuff to delay death, to conquer it, to conquer... I'm sorry, did you just say that abortion is to delay death? That's an interesting take. Life to conquer nature, and it's all just very- I guess it can be if it's a life-saving, you know, D and C, but- You're wrong. That's not a bad thing. I guess none of them are. To me, I mean, these people who've had like a hundred organ transplants just refusing to die, like, and I- Who is the straw man that they're even trying to fight here? Damn you for getting an organ transplant. I completely understand, by the way, that if and when this happens to me or someone I love, I will probably feel very differently, but that's... Oh, okay, so you're just admitting you're a hypocrite. Cool beans. Always how these things go, right? Like, in a clear mind, it seems bizarre and wrong, but in a moment of desperation, who knows? You know, that's why this story is a reminder that as a man, as the head of the household, you need to be a leader, you have to be strong, and you have to have a strong faith in God, because if you don't, who knows what you'll be tempted to put your faith into as an alternative. You have to focus on your family, you need to be realistic, not think impulsively, not think with emotion, not try to conquer death or life or delay the inevitable. John doesn't think emotionally, okay? He just leaves all his faith in the almighty God that he both fears and loves. You know, rational stuff. Not debase yourself, not dishonor those you love, because look what happens otherwise. This guy couldn't keep it together, and it cost him his wife, cost him his friend, his own life, now his daughter's an orphan. All just very terrible. But hey, that's j Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel. You know, yeah. Knock, knock, trick or treat. Leave the thumbs up, please. Put the thumbs up in the bowl. I, I trust community, okay? I'm gonna trust that you're gonna do this. I don't have to monitor. I don't have to sit in this sort of nook by the front door and wait individually as you all come. You have to, I'm trusting, okay? I'm trusting you to leave the thumbs up. If you what don't leave the thumbs up. Carrie? I think he thinks Carrie is about demonic powers based on what he said. If you don't go to undertack.com, if you don't subscribe to the channel, we are all literally going to die. Also, leave a comment. What did you think? What other movies did I miss out on that are implicitly right-wing? What about explicitly right-wing? What about subtly right-wing? Is there even a difference between that and the former? Who knows? Let me know in the comments. Um, turn on post notifications. You probably missed my last 30 videos, which were all posted between the months of August and presently. Uh, so turn on notifications. Also, share the video. The last 30 videos? John. In the past year, you've put out one, two, three, four, five, six videos. With a friend. I know some of you aren't doing that. I know for a fact, I'm looking at the numbers and I know that. Thumbs up, comment, subscribe, turn on post notifications, subscribe. We kind of, we covered subscribe, sort of, and then share the video with a friend. Okay, happy Halloween. Um, by the way, I am not wearing a, you know, not that it matters. It's not the Great Pumpkin. It's the Great Vermont Pumpkin Festival. My attendance at which is ambiguous at best. It, okay. Okay, bye. Yep, very cool. Why did I clarify that? Oh, yeah, because I was watching the footage. Oh, God, this is embarrassing. And I thought, what if they think I'm wearing a, a crew neck that literally says, like, the great pumpkin, like the Charlie Brown thing? And then I was like, I don't Would want... that be bad? Charlie Brown is pretty Christian. Charles Schultz was religious and put religious themes, Christian themes, into peanuts. I falsely advertised myself as, like, a big Charlie Brown guy. I mean, I'm a Charlie Brown guy as much as anybody is a Charlie Brown guy. But a little free advertising. This video is sponsored by the uh, great... Vermont Pumpkin Festival, by the way, they fully endorse everything that I've, they wrote, they wrote this video, they wrote all the points for this video. Um, I didn't think of any of them. I've never even seen any of the movies I discussed. I don't even know what a scary movie is. I don't know what a Halloween movie is. I don't, mm. none of these are my idea. This is all fully sponsored and endorsed by the Great Vermont Pumpkin Festival, where I will be performing an iteration of the arguments in this video later tonight. So go check. Did you know that saying more things is always funny? Get out. Okay, bye. Jesus, terrible.
Yeah, they're not shorts. He doesn't have any shorts, it doesn't look like. All right. So, that's it for the YouTube stream today. I'm going to uh, uh, end this, use the bathroom real quick, go see my wife, and then we're going to start the Twitch stream for today, which is Rem Lazar. We're going to watch Rem Lazar. If you've never seen it before and you want to know what the fuck the Rem Lazar memes are about, we're going to go watch it on Twitch. So I'll see you guys in about five, ten minutes over there. And thanks for hanging out here on YouTube. If I don't see you until next week here on YouTube, or for you're a YouTube-only person, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate you. Um, thank you again, Clyde, for all the goddamn gift subs or gift memberships. That was that was just out there, and I appreciate it so much. All right. So I'll see you guys later. Uh, 